The Prophecy Club, a nationwide television program, a nationwide radio program. The Prophecy Club also hosts approximately 40 major city meetings per month. Our mission is to inform Christians of current events that confirm Bible prophecy, expose the evil devices of Satan, warn believers what is coming to America, challenge people to stop sinning and turn to Jesus with all their heart and to provide a platform for Christian speakers to be heard. It's a bald-faced lie. Using the positions of power and authority in our own government. The greatest oil field in the world is at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. He said, son, you must warn this nation. And now your host for the Prophecy Club, Stan Johnson. Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. And you know, Bible prophecy says in the last days that craft will prosper. It says in the last days that many, the love of many will wax cold, and we certainly see that today. We see our beloved nation and many of the nations around the world turning to so much evil. Tonight's topic is Under the Spell of Harry Potter. See, there's a series of books and now a movie out on Harry Potter. Many people, many Christians think that Harry Potter is just wonderful. As a matter of fact, they even think that it's got some good Christian values in it. Well, tonight our speaker is going to expose the latest device of the devil, this Harry Potter stuff. Unfortunately, the average Christian does not recognize that Harry Potter is in fact evil and is being taught not only in public and private schools, but in some churches. Knowing evil and exposing it is the best way to avoid it. Under the Spell of Harry Potter explores the very core of what is being taught in today's churches, in today's public schools. Stephen says <clears throat> that Harry Potter actually teaches children to use spell casting, potions, and curses. It teaches children and those that read it, and I say that because I saw a lady on the plane sitting next to me reading Harry Potter the other day, says that witchcraft is being promoted by Christian leadership in the church and most Christians are blind to it. Your speaker tonight is an ex-Satanist high priest saved by the blood of Jesus. He is known for his first video, The Occult in Your Living Room, which he has exposed the subtle devices that Satan use, uses to bring evil into the homes of Christians. Will you help me welcome your speaker, Stephen Dollins. Thank you. It's been uh, over two years, a little bit over two years, since I was on the Occult in Your Living Room tour. And uh, at that time, we were doing things like exposing uh, Pokemon and Teletubbies and the Furbies and the, the video games and Harry Potter. And we touched just a little bit on Harry Potter. And it seemed like the Pokemon just started kind of dying down. Not that it's not still out there and that it's still prevalent, but it's not as big as what it used to be, praise God. And... Uh, but it seemed like what was happening was that Harry Potter was taking its place because the Harry Potter started rising until it became the number one device that was being used uh, in, in the witchcraft world and the occult world to use to lure our children into witchcraft and the occult. And I started really, really getting into uh, studying what the whole premise behind Harry Potter was, and it will shock you when you find out some of the things that, uh, that go on in Harry Potter. A lot of things that are in the books, children will read them, and they'll read the fun, and they'll read the exciting things that are in the books, but they'll kind of pass over the darker things. See, there's a lot of uh, ritualistic things that are in there that we used to do, things that I used to do when I was a high Satanist priest type of rituals. There are also blood rituals that are in the Harry Potter books. And if you ask a child, you know, that if they saw those things, they'll tell you no. Because what they do is they read that and they say, well, that's just part of the story. Not really realizing that those things are in there. And a lot of times you'll start to ask them what, what they read in the books and they'll tell you all the fun and exciting things and they'll leave the dark things out. And if you go back and you ask them and you say, well, what about this? They'll say, oh, I didn't see that. 
didn't see that at all because they were blinded to that. See, a lot of the things that have happened in, in the world today, and, and I've said this before, and I really believe this, the reason that we have the problems in the world that we have now is because a lot of good-hearted, well-meaning Christians have sat back and literally done absolutely nothing about it. And now, not only do we have witchcraft in the home, we now have witchcraft in the school system, and I'm going to show you tonight, we have witchcraft in the church. And brothers and sisters, that is something that God will just not put up with. And then we start wondering why things like 9-11 happens. Why God pulls the roof off of this great nation and says, Whoa, you need to get on your knees, you need to repent. There are some things that you are doing that you need to be aware of. And, you know, God cannot bless our nation if we have iniquity and witchcrafts. He just can't do it. He's a just and loving God. So tonight I'm going to be reading to you a lot of things that, that, uh, uh, from the book themselves. I'm going to be uh, exposing a lot of statements that not only the author herself says about the book, but also what she has to say about good fundamentalist Christians who question her books. And you will find that Joanne Kathleen Rowling, who is the author of this Harry Potter series, will say one thing and then turn around and contradict herself over and over again. You see, it just happens that way. That's how Satan works. He, he tries to do something, but he always ends up stumbling over his own feet. Amen? Amen? So, what we want to do is we want to look at the series itself, and we want to examine just exactly what's in there. Now, I'm not going to sit, uh, stand up here and tell you that, you know, you cannot read this, or you cannot go see the movie, that sort of thing, because that's not for me to do. What my job is, is to expose to you the things that I have found. And I'm not one that's going to stand up here and say, okay, I read this or I researched this. I didn't. I lived it for seven and a half years. I was a high Satanist priest in the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey's Church of Satan, for seven and a half years. I know these things. And when I start to see these things in children's books, it startles me. It shocks me. And it's, it becomes my job then, because I, I've told the Lord and committed with him a long time ago, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And he said, I want you to expose the things that you know. And, I, you know, as I stated on, I think I stated on the first video, you know, I, I told the Lord, I said, well, Lord, if anybody knows about Satan and his devices, it's the Christians. And he said, you go and I'll show. And he's been doing that all along. How many brought your, your swords with you tonight? Yeah, just kind of hold them up. Survey time. Okay. For those of you who did not bring your sword with you, you get my famous saying. Never go anywhere without your sword because you never know what kind of dragons you may have to slay. Amen? I, I said that one night in a, in a meeting and then went to reach for my Bible and discovered I forgot it. <laughs> Praise God. I, I, I repented and somebody else gave me their Bible and I was okay. But tonight, what we want to look at, we want to look at what God has to say, the Lord God, the creator of heaven and earth and all that is in and below, what he has to say about the things that we seem to think are fantasy. It's okay because it's a comic book, or it's okay because it's a movie. Now, I remember in 1999, when I was on tour, the, the Occult in Your Living Room tour, I made the statement that I had heard that there was going to be a, a, a rumor that there was going to be a major motion picture made by a big production company, one of the major production companies, movie productions. And I stated at that time that it would be the number one movie. Not only would it be the number one top-selling movie, it would also, when it was released in video and DVD, would also be the, the top seller in that, and also that it would be the top number one rental. Well, that prediction came to pass. Um, in November 16th of just last year, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone was released. And it's not a cartoon. It's not like the Pokemon cartoon, which is what we call Japanese anime, more of, a, more of the, uh, the cartoon type of characters. This is done with actual live characters to make it look more realistic and make it look more real to the people that are watching it, especially the children because it makes witchcraft look fun and exciting. And it makes the child begin to wonder what it would be like to be able to do the things that these kids in the movie can do. And isn't it also 
kind of odd that about a month after this, this movie was released, you also had Lord of the Rings. Now, let me say something about Lord of the Rings. I wanted to touch just a, just a little bit about Lord of the Rings. I wanted to cover Lord of the Rings along with this because so many people were asking about it. But I didn't have time because there's so much in Harry Potter and so much to get through with Harry Potter. But I do want to say this. Do not let anyone tell you that Lord of the Rings is a portrayal of the life of Jesus Christ. That is an out-and-out -out lie. While it is true that J.R.R. Tolkien was a Christian, he also went to Oxford University. And he was a philosopher. And if you'll begin to look, because he was English, the certain denomination that he was a member of believes in the sovereignty of God, but they do not believe in the things of the Spirit of God. In other words, they don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. Now, knowing that, you have to look at, if you are walking under the Spirit of God, then you are walking under His authority and you receive the things that God wants to give you. If you're walking in the middle, because you're not walking in the power of God, and you're walking in what we call the middle, you can be influenced by other things. I think that J.R.R. Tolkien meant to write that in a Christian framework, but it didn't come out that way. Number one, you have the Middle Earth. Middle Earth has always been looked at as being the place where hell is. You have goblins. You have elves. And elves were, are, are Celtic folklore. They're not the cu cute, cuddly little creatures that everybody is made to think they are. They were believed over there to be very harmful, demonics. And then you have a good wizard and a bad wizard. You have good magic versus bad magic. You have the same things in the Harry Potter series. And no wonder, because the same wonderful people that brought you Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone also gave you Lord of the Rings. It's the same movie production, New Line Cinema. It's a subsidiary of Time Warner, AOL. And it's no coincidence that it was released one month exactly after, after uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone came out. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone now, I heard just last night, has grossed over $900 million worldwide. It is the top-selling movie ever in history. A lot of people have said, well, Lord of the Rings is right up there. No, it's never even reached anywhere near that. And it will continue to be popular. They do not want to let this thing die down. It might also interest you to know that the Warner Brothers uh, production company has already said also that they now have the second movie ready to go. You see, this was meant to be a three-series book a three-part book written by Joanne Kathleen Rowling, and she stated that it, because it became so popular over in the UK that she decided that she would turn it into a seven-book series. Warner Brothers has already vowed that they will make a movie for each one of the books as they come out. So you have, let's see, Lord of the Rings, you have to look forward to two more movies, and Harry Potter, you have to look forward to six more years of him. Okay? Just a little something to throw in there for you. So, for the, the, uh, the benefit of those who did not bring their sword, I did the work for you. Everybody said thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 18, and we're going to start with verse 9. Because it is important to see what God detests and what he is saying about the things that he detests with his whole heart. Now, I believe I stated before on the last tour that when you see the word abomination, that is the closest word to hatred that you are going to see God use in Scripture. That means he detests that thing wholeheartedly. That means that it is so sinful and so dirty and so black that he cannot even look upon it. And yet we allow these things into our homes, into our schools, into our church, and now we've even allowed it into our country to flourish. And we wonder why we're not getting the total blessings of the Lord. So let's take a look at that. We start out in verse 9, and it says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. And I ask you, brothers and sisters, did God give us the United States of America? Absolutely. Deuteronomy 18.10 says, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. 
That's human sacrifice. Do we have human sacrifice today? Absolutely. What do you think abortion is? Or that useth divination. What's divination? Fortune telling. Miss Cleo. Everybody seen the, the Miss Cleo commercials? And, you know, like I said before, you know, you wonder if these people had, could tell their lucky numbers and all those things, why are they sitting behind a 900 phone line collecting a paycheck on commission? You know, if I could tell all my lucky numbers and be able to, to, to bet on anything and win, I'd be living at a big mansion somewhere with about eight cars and three swimming pools. You know, divination also includes any kind of uh, fortune-telling device that is considered to be a cult, uh, like the tarot cards. I call them tarot cards. The uh, Ouija board, things like that, crystal balls. Then he says, or an observer of times. What's that? Astrology. Look into the stars and the planets for your destiny, trying to chart your, your life by the stars and the planets. And if you do that, you're in real serious trouble because the kind of weather we have, you can't even see the stars and the planets. <laughs> now, he goes on to say, or an enchanter. What's an enchanter? Well, some of you ladies are sitting next to one tonight. You brought him with you. True. He said the right words. He said the right words to get you to go out on the date. He said the right words to take you to dinner. He said the right words to put the ring on your finger. True? Hopefully he said the right words at the altar. An enchanter is one who speaks something over and over and over again or shows an image over and over again until it gets into the psyche, until it begins to corrupt the soul. See, that's how Satan corrupts the body is he knows that if he can corrupt the soul first, then he can corrupt the spirit, tear down the spirit, tear down the mind, so on and so forth, and that's how he begins to bring a person down. So an enchanter is one who speaks something over and over again until it becomes a belief system, or because it's teaching something. How many, now this has been on for about six weeks, they was on for about six weeks, and then they took it off the TV, because I think enough people started writing in, really complaining about this, but how many here have seen the Skittles commercial with the gargoyle? Anybody here? Okay, doesn't seem like too many. So let me explain it. It starts out, and it's over in England because there's cobblestone streets, and it starts out in black and white, and you see four children running down the street, and they're small children. And as they get to this wall, you start panning up the wall with the camera, and as you're going up the wall, there's gargoyle faces on that particular wall. Now, gargoyles are images of demons. And as it gets to the very top of that, there is a big, huge demon with his wings pinned back, standing up there, and all of a sudden, you see the eyes light up and start glowing red, and you see the mouth open up, and you see the sharp teeth. The very next scene that you see are the children standing underneath the gargoyles' heads, and Skittles candy is pouring out of those mouths into their hands. Now, you look at that, and you think, well, that was kind of a cute commercial, but it was teaching something. You see, that's exactly how Satan gets us into sin. Didn't that taste good? Didn't that feel good? Let's do it again. And let's do it again. And let's do it again until the point where you get so deep into it that when you realize what's happened, it's too late to turn back. That's exactly the same things that the Potter books do with our children. They get them in because they lure them in with the fun and the excitement you know, it's fun to ride on broomsticks, and it's fun to be able to cast spells and make all kinds of potions. But then when it gets into the darker side, and they start to realize what's happened, they're already hooked. It's too late to back out. They're already associating themselves with the Harry Potter characters, and they don't want to leave it. It's now become a part of them. It's now become a part of their life. And they can't wait for the next book because they have to find out what happens. And each time... It goes on to say, or a witch. Now, you'd be surprised how many people in, on this tour have come up to me and asked me, do you really believe that there are such things as witches? Duh. <laughs> yes. And the Lord seems to think there are too. Let me explain. A witch is primarily, traditionally, and exclusively a female practitioner of what's called the old craft. They have a witchcraft coven. And that's a group of 13 with a high priestess, and sometimes there'll be a high priest if it's a group of men. Very rarely in a witchcraft coven is a male even allowed into the coven to even view what's going on. 
the, uh, the male counterpart of that would be called a warlock. And then in Deuteronomy 18, 11, the Lord says, or a charmer. Well, what's a charmer? One who seduces. One who uses a spell, hex, or a curse to seduce you into something until the point, again, to where you get so deep into it that you don't realize what's happened. It can be anything from a book. It can be a record. It can be a piece of jewelry. And the groups that actually make these things, let's, let's take, for instance, a, a satanic rock group. Let's say that they are worshiping Satan, and that is their god. And they put out a satanic album. In other words, there's nothing on there except songs that are glorifying and paying homage to the devil, their God. They will put codes on the very front covers of those albums. In other words, they will put symbols or they will put writings, occult writings on, on the front of these things so that you know that if you're a practitioner, you know that the real thing is in that particular article. They're called codes. And what they do is they really bless those things. Now, when we're in, in Christianity, when we bless somebody, we give them something. When we want to be blessed by the Lord, we want the Lord to give us something. Well, they want to give us something, too, except we don't want it. Okay, what they do is they actually ask a spell over that particular article, as in a piece of jewelry. And demonic spirits, which are, which are disembodied spirits, can and do inhabit inanimate objects. I've seen it over and over again. And what they do is if they'll make a piece of jewelry, like uh, I, I mentioned this before, but everybody heard of Sarah Coventry jewelry? Stands for Sarah's Coven. It's a group of witches. And they, what they do is they make that jewelry, they cast spells over that thing, and they ask for those demonic entities to actually go into that piece of jewelry. So you take that piece of jewelry from the store and you put it around your neck, or you take it home and you put it on your wall or wherever. Guess what else you just brought into your home with you? Okay, so an enchant or a charmer. Then he says, or a consulter with familiar spirits. Well, familiar spirits are the demons that are around you 24-7. You see, we know that there are angels of the Lord, and we know that they're around us all the time. But we don't see them. Some people have, have the blessing to be able to see them, called discerning of spirits, the gift of discerning of spirits. But most of the time, we don't see them. However, we know they're there. We can feel their presence. There's been reports after reports of people being saved by angels. Uh, someone being drowned and, and a hand will grab a hold, an unseen hand will grab a hold and pull that person up. Or uh, the steering wheel will go out of control and something will grab the steering wheel and bring it back onto the road and stop the car, saving that person's life. That's, that's an angel. That's an angel of the Lord, a ministering angel. Demons are also disembodied spirits, fallen angels, and they also operate in our physical realm. So what they do is they begin to listen to each and everything that we say, and they watch the things that we do. And these are the kind of spirits that you go to a seance when you're trying to contact uh, Uncle Fred, who's been dead for 30 years. You want to find out where the money is, because he had an inheritance, and you want to find out what happened to it. And you go to a, a, a seance, which is uh, where the, they sit around in a table and all hold hands, and the person acts as a medium, a, a spirit guide, and their eyes roll up in the back of their heads, they go into a trance, and all of a sudden the voice of Uncle Fred, who's been dead for 30 years, starts speaking through this person and tells you where the money is. And so you go home and you open up the pantry or the cupboard and, and you look behind the glasses where the voice told you to go, and sure enough, there's the loose brick, and you open up that loose brick, and you might find 500 to to $1,000 maybe stored behind there. Well, the spirit knew that it was there. And that is what communicated to that medium what to tell you. And so guess what? Now you're going to be going back to that medium over and over and over again because you want to find out what else Uncle Fred might have left behind. And then he says, or a wizard. What is Harry Potter? A wizard. A wizard is traditionally, exclusively, and primarily a male practitioner of black magic. That is a wizard. They use spells, curses, hexes, vexes, everything, potions, all of that. Or a necromancer. Necromancer is one who summons back spirits of the dead for divination purposes. They seem to believe that, that if you're dead, you know about the past, present, and future, and so therefore you, you have a vast knowledge of things. 
Deuteronomy 18, 12 says, For all, not some, but all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy 18, 14 says, For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners, but as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to do so. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, God has not called us to condone witchcraft in our land. He has not called us to condone witchcraft in the home or in the school system or in the very church itself. But yet we have done that. Exodus 22:18. you don't have to turn there, says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Now, in exclusive terms, you know, in uh, the, Wizard, the, the Wizard of Oz, you have a good witch, you have a bad witch. In Lord of the Rings, you have a good wizard and a bad wizard. In Harry Potter, you have good witches and wizards, and you have bad witches and wizards. In God's eyes, the only good witch is a dead witch. That's what the Lord says. That's what his word says. Thank God we're not living in the old times under the old law. We'd be stoning people right and left. I think we're still so supposed to stone them, but I think it's with kindness and with love. 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, are we in the latter times? Yes. Absolutely. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Well, these are the things that we have let in. Doctrines of devils, and we've let seducing spirits actually do that. They've seduced us, and they are seducing our children. You see, everybody now is, is, is all worried about 9-11 and, and the, you know, the bioterrorism and all this, and I don't, I don't say that we shouldn't be concerned about those things. We definitely need to be concerned about those things. But how the devil works is this. He will get you to focus on one thing and look on that one thing only. And while you're focusing on that, he'll come through the back door with something even more, more evil and bigger. That's the way he works. So, I'm going to start out tonight by quoting from a Time Magazine article. And this is the September 20th, 1999 issue. And the article was entitled, Wild About Harry. Now, need to explain that this actually started in the, in, uh, over in Britain by a British authoress named Joanne Kathleen Rowling. She states that she is not a writer. She never meant to be. She wrote a short story on uh, rabbits, and she sold it to Bloomsbury Publishing Company. And that's the, the uh, children's publishing company over in the UK. And it didn't go very far. It went on the market, and a few people bought it, but it really didn't get really anywhere near popular. And so she decided that she wasn't going to write again. In 1997, she began to get different messages. And those messages came to her while she was on a five-hour train delay on a trip from, London, from Manchester to London, England. And during that five hours, she said the idea of Harry Potter came to her. And after that five hours, when she finally reached her destination, she says that not only were all the Harry Potter characters already fully formed, and not only was all the storyline and the plot already fully there in her mind for the first book, but it was also for the other six. No author will tell you that they've ever received that kind of inspiration before. What she's telling you is that within five hours, and she says that it just kind of popped into her head. So what she's telling you is that whatever popped this stuff into her head, popped in five long books, and then she says that she got the idea from those five books, and she put the last two books together in five hours. That's just virtually impossible. I mean, your mind doesn't work that quick. 
And you will see a lot of statements that she makes, you will see tonight that she contradicts herself and that what she says about the way that these things came to her is not quite normal. There's something else behind it. Now, how many know that Satan can't read your mind, but he can sure pop things into your head? Okay, that's where you get the idea about going and sinning. Because those thoughts start coming in your head. They start flooding in your head. You don't even have to think about it. They're just all of a sudden there. Well, guess who's putting them there? So this article, entitled Wild About Harry, the article starts off by saying, the exploits of a young wizard have enchanted kids and adults alike and brought a new kind of magic to children's literature. Then it goes on to say, first of all, for the uninitiated, here are three surefire signs that you are a muggle. Now, I hope we have some muggles in the audience tonight. But let's see, let, let's take the test and find out how many we have. The first surefire way to find out if or not you are a muggle is that you see a boy or a girl in one of your local malls, and they're walking around, a young, young boy or a girl, they're walking around the mall, and as you begin to notice, they have something on their forehead. And as you get closer, it is a purple lightning bolt, either tattooed or stamped on or drawn on or painted on their forehead. That's the, one of the surefire signs. The second way to find out if for sure that you are a muggle or not is that you think that books or reading has take the, taken the place of electronics. See, that just doesn't happen. In these days of all these video games and things that all of our children want, and get, want to get a hold of and play with, and they're asking for books, there's something wrong here. You know, I remember last Christmas, it, Harry Potter was number one on the Christmas list. Rather than ha getting something to play with, the children were asking for books to read. There's something wrong with that picture. I mean, you think about it. And the last surefire way to find out whether or not you're a muggle or not is you don't know what a muggle is. So for those of you who have been off the earth for about the last four years or have been hiding your head in the sand saying it's just fantasy, I don't need to be concerned about it, let me tell you briefly the story of Harry Potter. Harry Potter is a story of a young boy who is orphaned as he is a baby. And he's orphaned because he's told that his parents were killed in a car accident. And he is taken by witches and wizards and placed on the doorstep of his only surviving family, and they are called the Dursleys. And the Dursleys are like the wicked stepsisters in Cinderella. They make him live in a small compartment underneath the staircase, and every dirty job in the house that they don't want to do, they give it to Harry. And Harry is treated like a literal nobody. In fact, they tell him over and over again, you should be blessed, you should feel lucky that you have a roof over your head, and you should, you should just be thanking us that we took you in and, and you know, gave you a place to live, even though we treat you like dirt. And so Harry is a nobody. He's told he's never going to mount anything. And Harry begins to believe that until the age of 11. When he reaches the age of 11 years, something wonderful happens. A giant named Hagrid comes to the door and delivers an invitation to Harry. And that invitation says that he has been accepted and invited to join Hogwarts School of Wizardry and Witchcraft. And the giant begins to let Harry in on some secrets, like the secret that Harry's parents were not killed in a car crash, that they were actually killed and destroyed by an evil wizard named Lord Voldemort. And Lord Voldemort is a very powerful evil wizard and knew that Harry was destined to become a powerful wizard himself and did not want any competition. And so the only way to deal with that is you destroy your competitor. So he went to the house, the Potter house, and he put a curse on them. And he destroyed the parents with a curse, and he tried to destroy the baby Harry, but he didn't get the job done. However, from that curse, Harry received his trademark. And that is a purple lightning bolt scar in the middle of his forehead. And that becomes Harry's mark. And from that mark, he gains his psychic powers. And he also gains the uncanny ability to communicate with serpents. 
he can communicate with serpents and, and the serpents communicate back to him. However, there is one other person that can do that and that's Lord Voldemort. And so Harry discovers that he is told that he is very important in the magic world. And in the magic world, everybody knows Harry there. And Harry can't understand that because he's never been there. But yet he's told that when you go there, everybody will know your name, everybody will know who you are, and you are one of the elite. You are very special, Harry. In fact, you will be embraced by everybody when you get there. And so Harry can't wait now to go there. And Hagrid tells Harry that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are the witches and the wizards, and those are the elite. Those are the people who have magic powers, and they use those powers, and they know how to use those powers for good or evil. And then, on the other hand, there are people called muggles. And muggles are people who have no magic powers, who have no special abilities, who are looked upon as being weak and losers. They're the lowest thing on the form of the earth. Now, guess what that makes Christians look like? Muggles. And the media is now beginning to use that terminology over and over again. Just the other night on uh, CBS News, I heard one of the news commentators start talking and he said, well, this would be easy for any muggle to understand. Now, why is it important to learn Harry Potter? Because if you try to minister to a child or someone who is caught up in Harry Potter and they start talking the lingo in there, the words, and you start looking at them like you have no idea what they're, what, what they're talking about, they will know that you don't know what you're talking about and they will turn you off in a red hot minute. You won't be able to get through to them. It's the same, much the same way when you, go, when you get into the Pokemon, how you have to really understand what it is and then sit down with them and minister to them about it. But you need to know what it is that they are concerned with and what it is that they are reading. And when you know that terminology, then you can begin to understand the ideas that they are beginning to portray to your child through these books. Guess what that makes mom and dad? Weak and losers. People without any powers. See, if you don't have magic, you can't fly, and you can't wave your hand and cast spells, they don't have anything to do. They know that there are people who can do that. And so what they do is they begin to associate with the characters, just begin to associate with Harry Potter, and they want to be just like him. So, praise God, now you found out tonight you're a muggle. You can be a muggle for the Lord. There is a Pied Piper who is playing different music. And he is luring our children away from the kind of moral standards and values that we want to teach them in the home and in the school and in church and directing them toward the darker things, the things of the occult. And his name is Harry Potter. Now, Harry goes and he learns how to ride on broomsticks. He learns how to cast spells. He learns how to mix potions. He learns how to perform curses, and he learns how to play the wonderful game of Quidditch. Quidditch is a game played on flying broomsticks. It's much like polo or soccer, and it's a fast-paced game. And he learns all those exciting things, and he also learns the ancient art of blood drinking. Oh, you didn't know that was in there? Oh, that's just part of it. You see, the child doesn't get that either, doesn't begin to see those things. You know, a lot of children don't see anything wrong with the Harry Potter books either because they are told by people that they are listening to that it's just fantasy. It's okay. It's okay to read. I've even had people ask me, should, you know, then you're saying that people should not go and see Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone movie. And I'm not saying that at all. I will say this, I don't think you should go see the movie or read the book unless the Spirit of God has directed you to do so for, for a particular purpose. I do encourage all ministers, I do encourage especially all youth leaders, all youth ministers, to go see Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Why? Because you need to know how the enemy works. You can't walk up and tell a child when they ask you, Mom, can I, can I go see the movie, and you say no, and they say, well, why? And you say, well, 
It's just bad. That's not good enough. Children are curious creatures and they want to know. They want to know everything. So you're going to have to sit down with them and explain to them what is in the movie, what is in the books that make them objectionable, and what makes them objectionable not only to you, but makes them objectionable to the Lord. So let's look at a couple of examples. Now, I'm not going to read their last name. That's not really important. But these are school children when they were asked what they thought about the Harry Potter books. And just listen to some of the comments. Here's Gloria. She's age 10. And she states, I was eager to get to Hogwarts first because I liked what they learned there and I want to be a witch. And then there's Harry. That's kind of ironic. Age seven said, I like the third book because here, Harry meets his godfather and Professor Lupin, a really cool guy, a shapeshifter who turns into a werewolf. Now in the occult arts, there is a practice called shapeshifting. In, uh, in, in the darker arts, they call it lycanthropy. And it is the ancient practice of being able to turn yourself from human form to animal form and then back to human form again much as in the werewolf. In fact, one of Harry's uh, stronger professors, a Professor McGonagall, a woman, constantly changes herself from female to cat and then back to female again. So she is a shapeshifter. To date, there are 110 million Harry Potter books in print worldwide. They are published in 200 countries in over 47 different languages. This is the widest promoted children's book ever. And if you look at some of the books that are out there, some of the Harry Potter books, they're thick. They're huge. I mean, I remember when I was a child, even Mother Goose books, you know, weren't that big. But the largest book to print is 734 pages. And you know what? A child will read that, and then they'll go back and they'll read it again. Then again, and again, and again. Remember how an enchantment works? over and over and over again until it becomes a teaching or becomes a belief. So you can see where a lot of the, our children are starting to really get into the Harry Potter series and why it's got them so well hooked. Now, to begin with, I need to show you just a few symbols, and we're going to concentrate on the symbols that you're going to see in Harry Potter. And these are occult symbols. Many, many times when the occult people that are in the occult or people in witchcraft, Satanism, Druidism, do something, they are not afraid to show you what they're doing. In fact, they're very proud of it. Remember that Satan fell because of pride. They are prideful, and they like to flaunt what it is they're doing. And many times, as I stated earlier, they will put codes on the things, the articles that they have produced, so that another practitioner can look at that particular code and know that the real thing is in there. So let's take a look at just a few of the symbols. We're going to concentrate tonight just on the symbols that are uh, prevalent with Harry Potter. Here's the first symbol, and it's called the pentagram. It is the universal symbol of all witchcraft. It's a five-pointed star, and as you see, the lines are intersecting. And then there is a circle drawn around that. Now you see that is different from a picture of a star like in the night sky or the star on the Dallas Cowboys helmet, or the stars on the flag, or stars. There are stars, then there's a pentagram. This is the pentagram. The lines are intersecting. And the witch will draw this on the floor, or wear this as a pendant around their neck, and they do this because they wear it as protection. And what they do is they will step inside of that circle and seal it, from the inside, light candles at each point of that star, and then they say their incantations, their chants, and they summon what they say are their spirit guides on the outside of that circle. And those things begin to take form on the outside of that circle. And they say that as long as you're inside that circle, you're protected. How many know that demon spirits do not need you to draw a circle on the floor if they really wanted to get to you? Okay? And you start looking at this stuff, and you know, we used to do the same thing in Satanism, except we would invert the star and turn it around with the two points up. And after I got out of that stuff, I looked at that and I said, you know, it never dawned on me if 
these things that we are summoning, like demons and spirit guides and all these universe spirits, if they are there to help us, why do we need protection from them? You start thinking about those things. I mean, if they're to help, why do I need to be protected? You get dumb when you're in that stuff. Here's the next one. It, too, is a witchcraft symbol. It's the crescent moon and the star. And it, in witchcraft, there have many different deities, and they say that Lucifer is just one of the lesser gods, just little g, okay? And they say that the greatest god is a female god, and she is a goddess, and her name is Diana, goddess of the moon, and this is her symbol. And in a witchcraft coven, if a woman is a high priestess of that coven, they will wear that symbol around their neck as in a pendant, or they could even wear it as a, a pin on their, their robe, and it will have like one, two, three, or four stars on a chain hanging down off of that, and that symbolizes their particular rank in that coven. So the goddess Diana. Here's the next one. This is the mark that Harry received on the middle of his forehead. It is the satanic S, the lightning bolt. And where do they get this from? Luke 10, 18, where it states, Jesus speaking said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Satan has grabbed onto that and said, that sounds really cool. We're going to use that for our, our symbol of our God because he fell like lightning. And so they've been using that symbol for hundreds of years. Uh, it was introduced in the 1940s by the Nazi SS, Hitler's elite group. You wanted to find out what anybody knew, all you had to do was call them the Nazi SS, and it didn't make any difference what they tried to resist. They were masters of torture, masters of pain. Uh, it was introduced then in the 1970s by a rock and roll band called KISS. And they put it on the end of their name, K-I-S-S, and all the kids thought that was real cool, not realizing that it actually stood for kings and Satan's service. But this is the lightning bolt that was on Harry Potter's head. It's also interesting that it looked like in the 90s that the Church of Satan was going to go under because Anton Zandor LaVey, the head of the Church of Satan in San Francisco, California, died of heart problems. And it looked like it was going to go under, but Carla LaVey, his oldest daughter, stepped forward and said, I'm going to take over where my father left off, and she revised the whole church. Their new symbol is that five-pointed star with the two points up and a lightning bolt now down through the center. But yet this is the, this is the kind of uh, seal, the kind of, of symbol that we are letting our children paint on their foreheads or tattoo themselves with. This is Satanic S. Here's the next one, and people have probably seen this before. This is called the Ankh. It's the Egyptian symbol, and it's a powerful symbol of reincarnation. You see, and if it was the cross, you see how the cross goes up from the bottom and it reaches the top. The Christian cross cuts off at the top because Jesus finished what he came to do. It was completed. However, in the Egyptian culture, when they are worshiping the sun god Ra, that loop at the, at the top of that cross that goes around, it says that life doesn't end, you just continue over and over and over again. If you made mistakes in this life, you can be reborn over and over again in different people and come back as someone else and just continue to continue to work until you reach that perfect state, until you reach that, that place of divinity. And so that's what this particular symbol represents. And... It is the, the premise of reincarnation that you will see over and over and over again throughout the Harry Potter books. This is one of the main teachings that they are projecting, is that there is no death, you just continue over and over again. Now, to a child, if they don't have to worry about death, they don't have to worry about sin. They don't have to worry about doing things that mom and dad don't want them to do. They don't have to worry about messing up in school. They don't have to worry about not following what the church says. Because, see, they can just be reborn over and over and over again until they reach that perfect state. And the last one, everyone seen this one? Everybody knows about the pyramid, the, you know, the, the seal of the Illuminati, the all-seeing eye. 
but it was introduced in a book called Magic, M-A-G-I-C-K, by one of the most infamous Satanists of our history, and his name was Aleister Crowley. He wrote a book called Magic in Practice and Theory. And in this book, he said that the triangle represented the three basic elements of all universal magic and witchcraft, and that is earth, wind, and fire. And so each one of those points represent earth, wind, and fire. Now, after seeing those symbols, and after I told you about that they will put clues on the articles that they have to let the actual practitioners know what is in there, let's take a look at the Harry Potter books and see if there's any clues to them. Here's the first book. This was introduced in 1997 in, in the UK. And notice that it is Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. And where they get this from is the Philosopher's Stone is supposed to be a product of alchemy. Alchemy is an occult practice of trying to turn base metals into gold. And in the books, it talks about the Philosopher's Stone. And also, J.K. Rowling seems to think that Nicholas Flamel, which is the man that she describes in the Harry Potter and the, and the Sorcerer's Stone book, is the man who found this particular stone. Oddly enough, if you go to a book called The Occult in Practice and Theory, A History of Magic, it also mentions Nicholas Flamel. And it states that he was the man who found what was referred to as the Philosopher's Stone. And that this Philosopher's Stone was an actual stone that on the middle of, part, uh, middle of that contained a potion. And it was called the Elixir of Life. And if you drink from this elixir of life, you can continue to live, as long as you continue to drink this elixir. Well, apparently, he drank most all of it because he ended up dying. And in the occult encyclopedia, it will tell you that Nicholas Flamel lived to be the age of 665. However, in the Sorcerer's Stone, Joanne Kathleen Rowling has him living to be the age of 666. Coincidence? Now, look at that book for just a minute, concentrate on that, and see if you see any occult clues in there. Here's what we see. We see a train. Uh, it's called Hogwarts Express. The Hogwarts Express is the train that takes the children from the platform nine and three-fourths to Hogwarts School. Then you see the character down in the, the right lower corner there, and that's Harry Potter wearing glasses, and then right behind him is a bus, and then that's the night sky, and those are just basic stars. So you really don't see a whole lot of, lot of clues in there. That uh, white particular arrow that you see there is pointing over to his forehead and pointing out the, the lightning bolt scar. But we really don't see a lot of clues in that book. You need to know that Joanne Kathleen Rowling, when, it, when Scholastic Inc. went over to the UK and said, we want to make your new book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, we want to bring it over to the United States. And she said, I will let you do that except under one condition. And that is that I have 100% say so in everything that is done to the book. And they agreed. So now remember that Joanne Kathleen Rowling, the author of this, oh, who also claims that she is not a witch, who also states that she does not believe in witchcraft, she does not condone witchcraft. She does not promote witchcraft. And she very, very rarely has an understanding of what witchcraft is. But she's writing books on it. Contradiction. She stated that she wanted 100% say so in everything that was done to the book. And so remember that everything, including the cover, Joanne Kathleen Rowling, the non-witch, has something to say about it. So now, let's look at the cover as it was introduced in 1999 over in the U.S. Notice, first of all, that the whole title has changed. It's no longer Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. It's now Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And let's look at the word sorcery. 
Sorcery comes from the Greek word pharma, which is where we get pharmakeia. And that's where we get pharmaceutical. And that means drugs. And in witchcraft, it's gratification or witchcraft through the use of drugs or potions. So now you have a sorcerer, not a philosopher. And notice it's Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And here, let's take a look at, see if there's any clues there. Because there's a lot. Here's Harry, he's riding on a broomstick, and he's going underneath an arch. Look at the very top of that arch, and on each side of the word Sorcerer's Stone, very clearly there, you see triangles. He's riding under the arch, he's wearing a red cape, and that's the red cape, it, it's a cape of invisibility that was given to him by his parents, and that cape, when he puts it on, makes him invisible to the naked eye, and that's how he can get around. He's wearing the red cape, and then he's wearing a sweater that's yellow, and it has red stripes. That would not be important except that most people think that in Satanism the primary colors are black. Not true. The primary colors are yellow and red. You see it's the color of fire. So could that be coincidence? You notice that as he's riding on the broomstick he's holding up his left hand. That in itself would not be significant, except that comes from the Jewish book of mysticism called the Kabbalah. And that's where we get the teaching that if you're born right-handed, you're destined to be a king or someone very important, someone who good, that will do good deeds. And if you were born left-handed, you are destined to become evil. You might even be a criminal or a murderer. And in Satanism, when you take the initiation, you, they say that, Jesus Christ sits on the right hand of the Father, therefore Satan sits on the left. And so when you come into Satanism, you're saying that you're leaving the godly world behind, everything that is good and holy, to the right, and you are crossing over to the left. And it's referred to as the left-hand path. This is clearly what is being symbolized here with him holding up his left hand. Remember, they don't do anything by coincidence. Down in the bottom corner there, you see in that uh, castle, underneath, the, that's Hogwarts, and you see in that uh, chamber there, is a three-headed demon dog named Fluffy. That's his name in the book. And I want to tell you, this is not the kind of dog like Fido that you want to jump up in your lap and lick you. This dog will eat you. This is actually a mythological creature called Cerberus. It is the three-headed hound of hell that guards the river Styx, S-T-Y-X, just like the band. So here's the demon dog down in, in the corner there. Notice that Harry has two lenses on his glasses. One is clear, the other one is red. Notice down in the, other, in the left-hand corner is a unicorn. Now, we know that there were unicorns in biblical times because they are mentioned in the Old Testament twice. The actual unicorn is mentioned twice. However, in the occult, the unicorn is looked on as being a symbol of enlightenment. If you look on that pole, and if you look close enough, you can make faces out on those, on those poles underneath that arch where Harry is writing. Clearly, there are clues on the first book. And Harry begins to go to this school, and he begins to go to all these different classes, and he learns how to ride on a broomstick. He learns how to cast spells and make potions. And then he has his confrontation with Lord Voldemort. You see, everything that they tell him not to do, Harry does it anyway. The Dursleys, despite whether or not they are his, you know, bad to him, are his parental guidance. That's his authority, parental authority. And so everything that the Dursleys tell him, he does just the opposite. He disrespects authority. Harry goes to this school of witchcraft and wizardry and places himself under their authority. But he rejects everything that they tell him. Everything that he, they tell him to do, he does just the opposite. And so he goes into this forbidden forest when he's told not to go in there, and he comes upon a slain unicorn. And there is a dark figure leaning over that unicorn. And as Harry gets closer and closer, he sees Lord Voldemort who's described as being uh, torn down because of all so many curses that he's projected out. And it says that every time that a wizard projects a curse out or a hex, 
that they grow weak and they grow different in, in their appearance. And it's described that Voldemort is now weak and something less than a man and so horrible you can't even look upon him. And so Harry walks up on Voldemort and sees that he is drinking the blood of that unicorn. He does that because that is the way that he stays alive. How many know that there's life force in blood? Don't believe it? All you got to do is slit your wrist. I mean, you don't, have to, you don't have to have a heart attack or anything else. Blood runs out, you're done. Just a medical fact. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, when he died on that cross that gives us remission of sins. It is the blood that overcomes death. Vampires have known that for hundreds of years also. The people that practice vampirism, the people who practice Satanism and Druidism also have blood rituals to where they actually drink the blood of the victim. There is uh, uh, several native Indian tribes that their old customs taught them that when you kill a deer or an elk, you drink its blood and then you get the attributes of the powers of that particular animal that you just killed. It becomes a part of you. The same thing. When they drink the blood of the victim, the victim now becomes a part of them and they're drinking in their life force. So this is exactly what Voldemort's doing. Uh, at any point, Harry uh, discovers the Sorcerer's Stone. He destroys the Sorcerer's Stone after going through mazes of monsters and dragons and Fluffy and all that. And he finally destroys the Sorcerer's Stone and Lord Voldemort is defeated, but he's still alive and he goes off to live to fight again and Harry survives uh, Voldemort's plans to kill him. Let's go to the second book. The second book to be released is called Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And you don't have to go very far to see the occult clues on that. Harry is clearly wearing the red cape again and that red and yellow tinted bird that he's holding on to is a mythological creature, a powerful symbol of reincarnation called the phoenix. Everybody's heard of the phoenix, the bird that went into the fire and from the ashes the new bird arises. And, and they're also now teaching that in the, uh, the New Age movement. You know, they say that the Christians are the ones that are the problems on the, uh, uh, presenting all the problems on the earth, and once we're wiped off and gone, then the new bird can arise, and it's called the phoenix. Hmm. So, look at the bird, and then you begin to look at the words written on the back of that wall, and the book describes that those words are written in blood. Throughout the Harry Potter books, not only is there the teaching of reincarnation, you will also find serpents throughout each and every one of the books. What has a serpent always been a symbol of? Satan. That's how he appeared in the Garden of Eden. You, clearly, if you look at that pole, you'll see a huge snake wrapped around that pole. And the eye, you see the head, you see the eye, and then the tail is red-tipped. Harry, again, is wearing his red cape of invisibility, and then if you look over at that torch on the left side of that wall, you'll see what looks almost like an onk. The snake, the, the serpent forming the cross part of it, and then the torch forming the loop at the top. And in this book, there have been a, a creature that's loose in the Chamber of Secrets, and it's been turning all the students into stone. And all the, the students, even Harry's professors, seem to think that Harry might be behind it. And Harry even begins to wonder whether or not he's destined to become evil. And so Harry goes into this chamber and he fights monsters and dragons and all kinds of things. And he comes up upon a wizard, I mean, a, a, I'm sorry, a witch named Jenny who has been kept under a spell by Lord Voldemort. And she's kept that way because he's put a curse on one of her diaries. And so Harry destroys the diary he defeats Voldemort for the second time. Voldemort tries to kill him, but Harry once again survives. Here's the third book in the series. It's called Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. And the Azkaban is a prison that all the bad wizards are sent to. If you did something bad, you used your magic bad, you go to Azkaban. And Azkaban, it says, is guarded by creatures called Dementors. And listen here to what one of Harry's professors tells him why they merit fear. He says, he tells Harry, they breed in the darkest, filthiest places, they create decay and despair, they drain peace, hope, and happiness out of any human who comes too close to them. Even muggles feel their presence, though they can't see them. Get too near a Dementor, and every good feeling, every happy memory will be sucked out of you. You'll be left with nothing but the worst experiences of your life. Now clearly, to me, this is describing a demonic spirit. 
because that's how demons work. That's what they do. They create despair. And this is one of the darkest speeches that you'll find in the Harry Potter books. Also, Harry is told that there is shape-shifting and there are killings and murders throughout this book. And once again, Harry fights Voldemort and defeats him, but he doesn't destroy him. He's not able to destroy him. And Voldemort is once again not able to destroy Harry. See, they don't want to end the book yet. And this is the fourth book. And it is the biggest book of them all. It is this book here. 734 pages worth. And it is called Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And it is also the darkest book as of date. Now remember that she's claimed that she's already have the four books out and there are three more to go. So, looking into Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, before we look into that, I want to tell you that this book was so anticipated that long before its release, months and months and months before its release, there were parents and children going into bookstores and they were putting in advanced orders for their copy of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Because it was anticipated that if you didn't get it then, it was going to be sold out. One Dallas bookstore, a small bookstore in Dallas, Texas, ordered 600 copies to stock in their bookstore. It is the largest order, single order, for any children's book. All 600 copies were gone in less than two hours. That's how popular this book was. And they decided, the bookstores got a wonderful idea, and they decided since the children were really going to be looking forward to this, they were going to throw Harry Potter parties all over the country. And so even news uh, uh, magazines and uh, uh, the major the news networks even started covering uh, stories about local towns covering these Harry Potter parties. And what the, the children would go and they were encouraged to dress up like their favorite Harry Potter character and the staff were also dressed up like the Harry Potter characters and they were going to have a party all night long until the book would go on the shelf the next day and they could buy it. Here's a picture of one of those parties. Here you see over in the right hand corner you see the two girls reading the Harry Potter book just as they got it. Uh, over in the left side at the very left top you see two boys standing there with Harry Potter glasses on complete with the lightning bolts painted on their forehead and they're displaying their copy of Harry Potter. Next to that on the uh, uh, upper right hand corner you see a poor girl who really doesn't know exactly what she is because <laughs> she's wearing a party hat and she's wearing a witch's cape and then she's wearing the Harry Potter glasses but they're red not black. Poor thing. So down in the bottom you see the kids down there and they're dressed up and there, there's a girl there, a, a teenage girl, she's dressed up in the witch's garb complete with the pointed hat. Here's another picture, the one at the top are, is the staff and they are uh, uh, interacting with the children down there. On the left hand corner on the bottom of that is a staff person and they are holding up a mirror. And this is a mirror from the book Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. It is the mirror of Erised. And the mirror of Erised, it is said, is that it is a way of divination to where you can look into this mirror and it will show you your heart's desire. And you can also communicate with spirits through this mirror. And it is said that the spirits will communicate back to you out of this mirror. Now in the occult, there is an actual practice of that. It's called scrying. And what they tell you to do is to sit in front of a mirror and you begin to, to concentrate on the face of that mirror Sometimes they will take a candle and light it in front of the mirror and have, concentrate on the flame trying to see through there and it is said that you will be able to see the past and the present and the future and that you can also contact and communicate the spirits through the, the face of that mirror. So you can imagine children now being told that and going and sitting in front of mirrors trying to conjure up spirits. And brothers and sisters, if you think that letting our children dress up and represent something that God says he hates wholeheartedly is just fantasy and that it's okay, we need to examine things again. 
because we are let them, we're letting them represent something that to the Lord he cannot even look upon. And yet we're letting our children do that. We're doing it to them. A lot of people encourage it. There are a lot of churches that, that, that encourage Halloween parties for kids to come out dressed as goblins and witches and ghosts. You know, it's not, a, it's not even okay to dress up like a Bible character. You don't celebrate Satan's holidays. But notice this young boy here, and here's the witch's hat. And he's also wearing the Harry Potter glasses. Oh, by the way, lens crafters came out with the Harry Potter glasses. And there were children flooding the stores that didn't even need glasses, but they wanted them because Harry Potter had them. Insane. Here are some of the spells that you find in the Harry Potter books. One of them is called flu powder, and this is how you transport yourself from chimney to chimney. And the way it works is this. If I want to come into your house and see what you're doing, and your fireplace is going, all I have to do is stand in front of my fireplace, I take the flu powder, I throw it into the flames of the fire, and I turn into a spirit-type form, and I pass through that fireplace, and from that fireplace in my home, I'm able to come out in your fireplace and watch everything that you're doing without you seeing me. And communicate and, and listen to you communicate you know and then I said that one night and all of a sudden it was like the Lord quickened to me that verse about thou shalt not make his son or daughter pass through the fire and then we wonder what what's going on you know and we called it in the occult astral projection the practice of going into a trance and letting your your spirit form come out of your body and actually travel in a spiritual uh, uh, plane and see things that you've not seen before, and hear people talking and everything else, and then you come back into your body. There are also curses. One of the curses that we find in the Harry Potter series is called the Imperious Curse. If I want to look like Stan Johnson, I'm better looking though. If I want to look like Stan Johnson, I'm pretty. <laughs> and I put a spell on me to where I not only look like him, I talk like him, I walk like him. In fact, to the point to where I could go into his home and his family would think that I was him. Imperious curse, impersonation. The other curse is called the cruciatus curse. And with this, you, you uh, inflict excruciating pain on the victim. In the occult, it's called voodoo, where you take an effigy of the doll of the person that you don't like or you want to put the hex or curse on. You put a picture or something that belongs to them onto that doll. At that time, you say the right incantation. You pick up a pen and you stab it into that doll, and the person's supposed to feel the pain in that same area at the same time that you stuck that pen. Now, let me say this. For anyone who thinks that practitioners of these arts have any kind of special powers or any special abilities, that is a lie, an out-and-out -out lie. It is not them doing it. The person who is the practitioner has no special abilities. What's happening is you are being kept bound by demonic spirits who are actually going out and doing these things for you, making you think that you're special. The more special you think you are, the deeper in you're going to get. Okay, that's how that works. Then we have the Avada Kedavra curse. And the Avada Kedavra curse is with a, a, a flash of green light, and it's a destruction curse. And you look at that, and it looks almost like the words Abra Kedavra that is used by all kinds of illusionists and magicians, uh, magicians and, uh, what is the word? You know, like David Copperfield, those sort of things, yeah. So Abra Kedavra, but it's called the Avada Kedavra curse. And these are Latin terms. It would not be anywhere near important except that in many phases of the occult, especially in Satanism, Latin terminology is used very, very prevalently. Latin language is used very prevalently. In fact, at the Black Mass, one of the most blackest masses of all in, in Satanism, you repeat the Lord's Prayer backwards in Latin. And an interesting thing happened when Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone movie came out because the children in the movie talk Latin all the way through there, pronouncing curses and spells and things in Latin. There was a rash on a run on libraries by children, young children, 
trying to get a hold of books on Latin. They wanted to learn the language. What does that teach the child? That if you say the right words, you can have what you want. If you say the right words, if you do the right motions, then you too can have what you want. So it's teaching not only that, but it's teaching voice command. Alistair Crowley, we talked about, wrote a book called Book of the Law. And look what he says. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. What that means is that you do what you want to do regardless of any consequences to anyone else. The Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey says basically the same thing. You do what you want. Then he says, one must find out for oneself and make sure beyond doubt who one is, what one is, why one is. And then he says, in the course of training, he will learn to explore the hidden mysteries of nature and to develop new senses and faculties in himself. Now that's right in line with the New Age teaching. What they say is you don't need a divine being because you are a divine being. You can be your own God. All you have to do is tap into those sources, those energies, those powers that have been laying, uh, uh, hibernating inside of you, and all you need to do is tap into those things, and when you tap into those things, you can be special. You can be part of that elite group. And so through that, children are taught not to interfere with the New Age occult transformation. In other words, they're taught that all you need to do is to tap into those special abilities, and you can become just like Harry Potter. You can become just like the, wizard, the wizards and the witches in the Harry Potter book, and you can have the ability to cast spells. You can have the abilities to fly. You can have the abilities to put curses on people. In New York State, there was an elementary school that suspended 10 students. This was on the Internet. And the, the article said that the students had been in a classroom where the teacher was sitting around in a circle and they were reading Harry Potter. And after they got through reading the Harry Potter for that day, they went out on the school grounds during recess and they picked up sticks and they started carving them in the, in the shape of magic wands. They went back into the school, walked up to the teachers and smacked them with the wands and started doing these Latin language curses on them. And a lot of the little, little students were saying, I'm putting a spell on you, teacher. Now you look at that and you think, well, that's not really important. Oh, yes, it is. Because they've just been taught something. Remember, what his teaching is, if they say the right words, do the right thing, they can have all these powers. And that not only that, they're able to, to administer curses and hexes on other people, able to actually cast spells. So, clearly, Harry Potter becomes Aleister Crowley's ultimate wizard child. Now, the fifth book, and I've heard different uh, sources have told me that different con uh, conflicting information. I've heard, number one, that it's to be released the end of this month. I don't think so. I think it'll be around October or November. You see, the next Harry Potter movie, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, is scheduled to be released in November of this year, just like the first Harry Potter was in November. See, they want to keep Harry Potter alive and number one on your Christmas list. And notice the title of this particular book. It's called Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. In throughout the Harry Potter books, the phoenix is a prevalent symbol. And remember that it is a powerful symbol of reincarnation. What they are teaching is reincarnation to children. This is one of the main, main subjects that they are concentrating on in the Harry Potter series. Now, what you're looking at is an artist's rendition of what they think the book cover will look like in the UK. I'm very curious to see what they're going to do, what kind of clues they're going to put on the book when it's released in the United States, because it definitely will not look like this. It'll be a lot more out-and-out out occult. But it's called Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. There, she says, uh, Joanne Kathleen Rowling says that the plot is secretive, that it's, uh, it's being kept under lock and key and will not be released 
until the time that the book is published and put out on the market. So we have that to look forward to. And now let's look at how the Phoenix is used in the Harry Potter series. This is Harry Potter. Um, he's being told, he's talked to about the Phoenix, and he says, Fox is a Phoenix, Harry. They make highly faithful pets. His ears full of the Phoenix song, his eyes furious and fixed from Chamber of Secrets. Now let's look at what Freemason Albert Pike has to say. And if you're not familiar with who Freemason Bishop Albert Pike, Albert Pike is the man who brought Freemasonry from Scotland to the United States. He also wrote a book called Morals and Dogma of the Scottish Rite. And it is a very interesting book if you can ever get a copy of it because it is one of the most exposing books of the Freemasons. Because on page 334 it states clearly, Lucifer is God. It's right there in their writings. However, the Masons go into the, the libraries and steal them out of there because they do not want you to be able to read what they believe. That's why they don't have windows on their buildings. But let's look at Morals and Dogma, page 774, because right here, Albert Pike also tells us that there is a code or a cue to that symbol. And look what he says. All the masters of alchemy, and remember alchemy is the ancient art of trying to turn base metals to gold, who have written of the great work. What's the great work? Trying to bring in the Antichrist system. That is their goal. Has been, will be, until it happens. Have employed symbolic figurative expressions. The entire work has for its symbols the pelican and the phoenix. So now we see that even in Freemasonry, the phoenix is a very powerful symbol. He goes on to say, the dove, the raven, and the phoenix are striking symbols of good and evil, light and darkness, and the beauty resulting from the equilibrium of the two. Stop for a minute. The phoenix is a symbol of not only good, it's also a symbol of evil. So what he's saying is there's a little bit of evil in everything that's good. He also says it's a symbol of light and darkness. What's that saying? There's just a little bit of darkness in every bit of light. And that there is beauty in the mixture of that. What does that tell your child? That there is beauty in witchcraft. That not only is it fun, that there is a beauty behind it, an expression behind it. And when you practice it, you are flaunting that beauty. You are bringing that beauty forward. Morals and Dogma, page 792. Alistair Crowley writes, The ancient condition is not restored, but a new and superior condition is created. A condition only rendered possible by the process of death. And then he says, death is but through accident. Now, clearly, he doesn't believe in resurrection. He believes in reincarnation. And Joanne Kathleen Rowling symbolizes his view of death by the phoenix. That's the symbol. Remember, the bird rises from the ashes and becomes the new bird. Harry sees it turn to ashes, and then a new bird is born before his eyes. The phoenix is always, always a vital part in Harry Potter's wizard life, in his training. Now, let's go back to that cover, because remember we said that on each and one of the covers, there is a cue, or clues. Look on that cover. Harry Potter, first of all, is holding on to a goblet. That goblet is one of the more prevalent practices, tools, used in Satanism and in Druidism. It is the cup from which blood is drunk from in Satanic rituals, when it's passed around. The victim's blood is allowed to run into that goblet, and then they pass it around the room, and each person drinks from that, drinking in, remember their life force, and making it a part, the victim a part of them. But there's something else interesting. Look in Harry's hand and notice that he's holding one of the more powerful tools of all wizardry. Every wizard has to have one. It's called the magic wand. And it's very, very interesting. After you just got through seeing what is spoken of by Aleister Crowley and Bishop Albert Pike about the phoenix and about clues, look at the clues in this particular. He says, 11 is the number of magic in itself. There is magic in numbers. 
And Aleister Crowley is telling us that 11 is the number of magic itself. He says, 11 is the sacred number par excellence of the new eon, as it is written in the book of the law. Then he says, 11 as all their numbers who are of us. What he is telling us is that all who practice black magic, white magic, witchcraft, Satanism, anything that has to do with the occult, fall under that magical number of 11. That there is magic in numbers. This comes from magic in theory and practice. Now, look at how it's used in Harry Potter. This is Harry Potter as he discovers his wand. And by the way, Harry is told that it is not the wizard that chooses the magic wand. It is the wand who chooses the wizard. Harry is told that his wand is very special because it is one of the only wands that contain a phoenix feather. And phoenix feather is what gives it its power. Isn't it also interesting that there is only one other wand that contains a phoenix feather, and that belongs to Lord Voldemort. So let's look at where Harry finds his wand. And it says, Harry had waved what felt like every wand in the shop. At last, he had found one that suited him, this one which was made of holly, 11 inches long, and contained a single feather from the phoenix. This is from Goblet of Fire. So here you have Harry with a magic wand made of a constructed wood called holly. So you have holly wood. <laughs> now you wonder why the motion picture industry is cranking out occult movies by the dozens. I mean, think about it. You can't even name on your fingers five movies that you've seen this year or in the last year that were totally wholesome. Most of them have overt occult significance in them. Most of them have something about communicating with spirits. Most of them are violent. Most of them show man as a lost animal, lost creature. But notice what he says, which was made of holly, 11 inches long, and contained a single feather from the phoenix. It's 11 inches long, because magic, the number of magic is 11. So, let's take a review. How old is Harry Potter when he finds out that he's a wizard? 11. How old do you have to be in order to join Hogwarts School of Wizardry and Witchcraft? 11. And how long is exactly is his magic wand? 11. Interesting. So let's take a look at Joanne Kathleen Rowley. Now this is the author of this wonderful series. And remember that she says that she does not practice witchcraft, that she is not a witch, and she doesn't promote it, she doesn't condone it. In fact, she says that she doesn't want her kids reading anything with witchcraft in it. But she is the author. And in this particular picture, notice that she is standing and in that pose Clearly, that's a mirror behind her. And notice that the back of her head is not the reflection, the same reflection in that mirror. There's a different face. It's also interesting to note that that particular mirror is in the shape of a sun. There you see the rays coming off of the, that sun. And she is standing there holding a gargoyle statue. We've all already said the gargoyle is a symbol of a demon. And she's also giving a salute. And that salute is this. When you become a satanic witch, you are saying you are coming from the right side, and remember again, everything that is holy, everything that is of God, everything that is looked upon as being on the right hand side, you take your right hand, and you say, I am crossing from the right hand path to the left hand path. And you put your hand on your shoulder like so. And clearly, clearly, this is the salute this is the pose that she is giving in this particular picture. And you wonder here, why a woman who claims that she is not a witch actually is giving witchcraft signs. However, if we look at a uh, Scholastic Inc., and remember that Scholastic Inc. are her publishers. They're the ones that publish all of her books and publish all of her materials. And if we look at an interview that Joanne Kathleen Rowling had with them in 1999, she seems to contradict herself. Because we find out that actually witchcraft was a childhood fascination. She started out having her early view of Harry Potter 
And she says that it was shaped by a, a young playmate named Ian Potter, and that Ian Potter had the same kind of similarities that the, the uh, uh, book character does. And she says that together they began to role play the practices that made her books exciting and fascinating. Then they decided that what they wanted to do was they couldn't get a hold of Ian Potter, so they decided to interview his sister, Vicki. And listen what Vicki says. She states, we used to dress up as wizards and witches. Joanne was always reading to us, and we, and would, we would make secret potions for her. She would always send us off to get twigs for the potions. So here you have a, a woman who claims that she doesn't know anything about witchcraft, but yet used to play it as a childhood fascination. And as an adult, Kathleen Rowling also majored in mythology at Exeter University in England. And you have to understand that she says that all these things in the Harry Potter series came from her vivid imagination. Well, we find out they didn't. And clearly, she's stolen a lot of things, not only from Greek mythology, but she's also stolen it from Satanism, witchcraft books, and Druidism. Here's what she says about how the Harry Potter books came about. And this was on, a, remember, a five-hour train delay between London and Manchester, England, and it also came in 1990. She says, I was sitting on the train just staring out the window at some cows. It was not the most inspiring subject when all of a sudden the idea for Harry Potter just appeared in my mind's eye. Now, where have we heard that before? The New Age Movement. The New Age Movement says that they believe that there's a third eye in the middle of your forehead and that you're able to use that to see into the psychic and the, and the uh, spiritual realm. Then she says, I can't tell you what triggered it, but I saw the idea of Harry and the wizard school very plainly. I suddenly had this basic idea of a boy who didn't know what he was. Then she tells Newsweek magazine, I had this physical reaction to it. I never felt like that before, and Harry came in this huge rush. And very bizarrely, he had this mark on his forehead, but I didn't know why at that point. It was like research. I didn't feel as if I were entirely inventing it. No kidding. She says, Harry just strolled into my head, fully formed. And then she says, the idea that there could be a child who escapes from the confines of the adult world and go somewhere where he has power, both literally and metaphorically, really appealed to me. Writing about Harry became my safe haven. And then when asked uh, on, online for UCLON, that's the UK Office uh, for Library and Information Networking, she said, ominously, Harry's going to have quite a bit to deal with as he gets older. Sorry if it gets too scary. So we have that to look forward to. Let's look at another photo of, of uh, J.K. Rowling. And in this one, you notice I put up there, I'm not a witch, because that's what she says over and over again. However, notice that she's standing in a street in England, and she's wearing a black robe. She's also giving the witch's salute, which are these two hands crossed across the chest underneath the chin. And the other interesting thing is, is this picture was sent to me by a man who reports to be a former warlock over from England, and this came out of a magazine that is made for, distributed, and published by and for witches, called the Equinox. So here you have a magazine, and if you read down in the very uh, bottom there, they are praising her for her stories of a boy wizard who uses his magical powers. Now, stop for a minute. If you were a practicing witch and the real witchcraft were not being portrayed in these books, wouldn't you be in an uproar claiming that your religion was being misrepresented? Amen? However, here are real witches who are praising her for her writings. What's wrong with that picture? That wasn't enough to have the fourth book, and so they decided that they would have two others, and these are just small booklets. Notice that the first book also is, is also yellow and red, in its cover, and it's called Fantastic Beast and Where to Find Them, and then they wrote Quidditch Through the Ages, and, and Miss Rowling actually didn't write these. Somebody else wrote them and then kind of put her name on there along with, with theirs, but these are just like small booklets because children were clamoring so much, they wanted so much more of Harry Potter, they decided to come out with these books. Here's an interesting picture because this is not at a Halloween party. This is at a Harry Potter party. 
And notice that these are three young girls are sitting on the floor. The one in the middle is wearing black. She is the high priestess. She is also holding what's called an athame, a sword that's used in spell casting. She also has a magic wand in her hand. And it's interesting to note that they're pointing downward. The two acolytes, or initiates, sitting on each side of her are in purple. One has a, a crescent moon on their hat. The other one has a star. And they are giving a very, very important salute. And I'm telling you, they did not get this out of Harry Potter books. They got this out of the real thing. These girls had studied some other kind of book and got that salute from it. Because it's this. In Satanism, when you identify yourself as being a Satanist to another Satanist, it's done with the index finger and the little finger, and it's thrust out with the left hand like so. And it doesn't mean I love you or anything else. It means hail Satan. It's the sign of the horns. In witchcraft, they do the same fingers, except that the thumb comes out, like so. If you are a satanic witch, in other words, you cross from the right-hand side from, the, from working good, and now you're going to practice evil or black magic, it is done with the salute with both hands pointed downwards toward the nether realm, hell. And they are giving homage to Satan through that salute. And these are young girls. They notice they're displaying proudly their, their Harry Potter books and they're sitting in front of the pentagram and candles all around there. And then notice they've already written the Avada Kedavra curse on the wall. And these are just young girls practicing, dabbling. We have to look at what these books are teaching because if they weren't a teaching tool, are you hearing me? If they weren't a teaching tool, they would not be in the school system. We send our kids to school, our children to school, to learn. We teach them things in school. That's the whole purpose of a teacher and school, is to teach. If something is in the school system, then it is used to teach something. Harry Potter is now being read in classes, and I can't tell you uh, how many young mothers came up with tears in their eyes when I was on, on tour even before this, uh, on the last tour, and saying that their children were being required to read the Harry Potter books in class. And there are a lot of uh, Christian teachers, born-again Christian teachers that are out there now that are really on a battlefield. I mean, they're struggling because the school system is telling them to read them Harry Potter, and they're saying no because it's witchcraft. I mean, what do you do? You have to choose between your job and what's right. So we have to remember that this is a teaching tool. What are they teaching? Let's look at that. First of all, disrespect for authority. Remember that everything that Harry's uh, authority tells him, he does just the opposite. He never, never, ever carries out what is being told to him. And not only does he do that, but each time that he disrespects the authority, he's never reprimanded or punished. In fact, he's rewarded. Even Albus Dumbledore, the headmaster at Hogwarts, goes to the other instructors and tells them, if Harry breaks the rules, just overlook it. Remember, he's special. So what does that tell your child? There's no consequences for breaking the rules. In fact, they can't understand when you spank them because they feel that they should be being rewarded for what they did. Secondly, that muggles or humans without magic powers is painted as being weak and losers. So what's that make mom and dad? Muggles. Parents and their strict rules are not to be honored. In the Harry Potter series, the witches and the wizards end up becoming the good guys, and the parents become the bad guys. And also that death is but the next great adventure. They're taught that death doesn't end, it just continues over and over again, and you continue to be reborn. You don't have to worry about dying. You don't die and go to a heaven. You don't die and go to a hell. You stay right here, and you just continue to live over and over again. That's being portrayed today. Here's one of the books, more popular books. It's called Light of Sacred Flame by Silver Ravenwolf. She is a popular witch out of the Pennsylvania area. Notice it says Practical Witchcraft for the Millennium. You see the, the woman on the cover there in the flame, and then you see the phoenix being reborn from her. What else is being taught is that there is beauty in witchcraft. Remember that what, everything that is magical is beautiful. The practice of astrology. Uh, there are two centaurs in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone talking together, and one says, have you not understood what the stars and the planets have told us? Things practiced and labeled as being evil in the Bible are referred to as good in Harry Potter. 
They are taught that there is no evil. Albus Dumbledore tells Harry, there is no evil, there is only power and those too weak to seek it. So there is no evil. Nothing is evil. It's just the way that you use it. And you notice that Harry Potter has power over death. In other words, Harry almost becomes a Christ-like figure because he's told that he is special because he is the only one that ever survived one of Lord Voldemort's curses. And he continually, continually escapes death. And then they are taught that witchcraft is to be fought with witchcraft. Throughout the Harry Potter books, throughout the Lord of the Rings, throughout all the things that have magical powers in them, you will notice that if someone puts a spell on you, you put a spell on them. If someone uses magic against you, you use your magic against them. So it's witchcraft versus witchcraft. Rebellion against parental and adult authority. Remember, he rebels against everything that's taught to him, everything that's told to him by his parental authorities. And it's also teaching revenge and hatred towards enemies. Uh, at one point from Sec uh, Chamber of Secrets, page 200, Harry's talking, he says, it's not possible to live with the Dursleys and not hate them. And then Hermione, one of his friends, says, I hate that Skeeter woman. And then Ron Weasley, one of Harry's friends, is speaking. He says, I wouldn't mind knowing how Riddle got that award for special services to Hogwarts either. Could have been anything, said Ron. Maybe he murdered Myrtle. That would have done everybody a favor. Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't teach us to hate our enemies. He taught us to love them. And most of all, they learn the real thing. Because here's what the Lord showed me. And I want to share that with you tonight. And it's been confirmed through other ministries that have been studying the Harry Potter series. Harry Potter, the books, the movie alone, I will agree with you, are not enough to draw a child into the practice of witchcraft or Druidism or Satanism. However, they are enough to whet the appetite for the real thing. What happens is, they, the, through the books, through the movie, their appetites become wet for, for the real thing. They want to learn how to do what Harry Potter does. And then when they go to mom and dad and ask mom and dad if they have any powers and they say no, and they go to the school teacher and they say, well, do you know about how I can do this? And they say no. They, use the one, they go to the one tool that's available to every child on the face of the earth now, the wonderful system of the Internet. And if you go on the Internet and type in spells, hexes, and curses, you will come up with 85,000 hits alone. That's not including satanic websites. That's not including witch websites like the witch's voice. That's not including all the other occult websites. Just spells and hexes and curses alone. And those sites are maintained and run by actual practitioners who are ready, willing, and able to teach your child how to do the real thing. That's how they're inducting our children. Now, when asked how Miss Rowling felt about fundamentalist Christians questioning her books and saying that there might be something a little more than just fantasy in them, do you want to hear what she had to say? No, you don't want to hear. Okay. When asked in an interview for CBC for Kids how she felt about fundamentalist Christians questioning her books, she replied, I think they need psychiatric help. She says, I say honestly, can they read some of them? Talking about the books. I think the Potter books are moral. By large, the Potter characters go with their conscience, which is a powerful thing. There you go. So, as she's saying, there you go. And if you think that something is wrong or this is not fantasy and you think that something's wrong with the movie or the books, you need to go and make an emergency uh, appointment with your psychiatrist. She also states in an interview posted on www.amazon.com, she says, I decided on the school subjects very early on. Most of the spells are invented, but some of them have a basis in what people used to believe worked. We owe a lot of our scientific knowledge to alchemists. Now, what she is saying is that in the books, there are spells that are invented, but there are also some spells in there that work, that are the real thing. Let's look at some of the things that... Uh, you will find of the occult in the Harry Potter books. 
One of the first things we find is ghosts. Now, the Bible specifically says that it's appointed once for man to die, and after that, what? Judgment. Not keep coming back and roaming around this world and watching what everybody else is doing, listening to everybody else's conversation. Doesn't happen. And we are told that we are not to even try to communicate with spirits of the dead because it says the dead know nothing. So, in Hogwarts, there are four fraternities. The first fraternity is called Gryffindor, and that's the fraternity for the, the good wizards and the witches. And then there is Slytherin, and that is for the bad witches and wizards. And their symbol, by the way, is a serpent. And then there is the gray area, gray witchcraft fraternities, and those are called Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw. And each one of those residences have ghosts in there, and they communicate back and forth with the students. The next thing we'll see is divination. Throughout the books, there's always divination, some kind of fortune telling. Whether they use crystal balls, whether they use uh, scrying, looking in the mirrors and conjuring up spirits, things like that. Again, this is an abomination unto the Lord. Then we've talked about the magic wand. It's made of Hollywood, 11 inches long, and it contains a single phoenix feather, and that's what gives it its power. There's spirit communication throughout the books. Uh, throughout the Harry Potter series, uh, Harry's dead father, the spirit of de Harry's dead father, constantly communicates to him and tells him secrets that he needs to know. Then there's mind reading. When you go to Hogwarts, every student goes through a ritual called the sorting hat. And the sorting hat is a crumpled witch's hat that's an actual living thing. And what they do is they sit the, the uh, student in a chair, they take this hat and place it on top of their head. This sorting hat reads their mind. And from the thoughts that they have, it determines which fraternity that student needs to go to. And at one point, they set the hat on top of Harry's head, and it almost puts him in Slytherin. Because it reads that he is, his thoughts show that he has the potential to become evil. Then there's always the casting of spells and curses throughout it. And they're not easily reversed. Here's uh, one of the more popular designs for the teenager. This is Teen Witch by Silver Ravenwolf. And you'll notice that on the front cover there, the girls are all wearing occult symbols. Uh, the one in the black top and the, and the blue dress is wearing the yin and yang. And by the way, I don't know if you know in, in Chinese culture, but everything is backwards in Chinese culture. They get married in black and they get buried in white. And that's also a symbol of reincarnation. And that black stands for good and the white stands for evil. And you notice that the other girl is wearing a red top next to her, and she has the pentagram on it. And then the girl over to the far left is wearing a red dress also with the crescent moon and the stars. And then here's this poor guy standing there in the middle looking duh with his hands in his pockets. What that is for is telling you that witchcraft is for females and that males are very rarely accepted. And if you like the book, now you can get the kit. This is something new on the market. It's called Teen Witch Kit. There again, you see the boy, you see the girl, you see the crescent moons and stars in the middle. Over to the far right, you'll see uh, right next to the girl, there is a spiral, and that is the Celtic symbol for male fertility power, complete with the lightning bolt in the center. Down from that is that, that rope or that cord is called a binding cord. What happens is you take the, a photo or a, a something that belongs to the boy that you want to put a spell on so that you can get him away from his girlfriend or that you can get him to love you and you bind the, that cord around the picture or around whatever it is that you've got of his and you say the right words and then it binds that boy to you. Then over in the uh, far left you see a, a symbol that has a moon and then on each side of that are crescent moons. And I walked into our local Barnes & Noble there in Topeka before we left on tour and there were four of these kits right along with the book. And about a week before we left, walked back in there to look for something else, and all those kits were gone. This is how popular that is. And then you look on that kit, and around that kit, there's that gold trim. And on that gold trim is writing. And when Stan and I were doing the, the uh, in his office, we were getting ready to do the PowerPoint for the presentation, he looked on there, and I couldn't decipher it. And he looked on there and he says, that's Hebrew. And I said, well, what in the world would Hebrew be doing on a witchcraft kit? Well, where did witchcraft originate? Some of the other things you see, Harry Potter, black magic blood rituals. 
I told you before that this is the darkest book of all, the Goblet of Fire. Let me tell you why. Hang with me here. In this particular book, it starts out with a killing. It starts out with a murder. Uh, one of the townspeople have gotten into Lord Voldemort's home, and he's beginning to listen to them plot on how they're going to destroy Harry. At that point, when he thinks he's hidden out of sight, a 12-foot serpent comes out of nowhere and scares him into the room. He's confronted by Voldemort. He wants to confront Voldemort, and he tells Voldemort that he's going to tell the police what they're plotting. And then he confronts Voldemort and says, turn yourself around, let me see you as you really are. And so that says that the, the, one of his men take the chair, the wheelchair, and turn it around so that he can see him. And it says it almost dies of fright by what he looks like. At that point, he says, I am not a, a man, muggle. I am much more than a man. And with that, he takes a wand and he kills that particular person kills Frank Bryce, the man who, who got into the home, with a curse. And it's the Avada Kedavra curse that we talked about earlier. At that point, Harry can feel that there is a murder at the same time that it occurs. Because the lightning bolt scar in the middle of his forehead starts to hurt. And he can't figure out why. Harry goes through some other things, but the really, really important thing is what happens toward the end of this book. Remember, this is 734 pages. They get through that first murder, and then they get through all the other things, the exciting things that happened to Harry in the middle part. Now listen what happens toward the end. Toward the end, Harry enters into a Triwizard Tournament. And in this tournament, the Ministry of Magic has placed a participating age of 17 years. In other words, you have to be 17 years of age in order to participate in this tournament because they feel that anyone under 17 could be killed. They're too, you're too young to participate. Someone illegally enters Harry's name into the Goblet of Fire. And that's where the names are drawn from to participate in this tournament. Harry knows that his name has been illegally entered. Does he do anything about it? Does he say anything? No. Albus Dumbledore, when the name is drawn, hears Harry's name drawn. Harry's only 14 now. He's not, no longer to the point to where he can... Uh, uh, participate in any tournaments like this, he's too young. And he hears, Albus Dumbledore hears Harry's name spoken when it's drawn from the Goblet of Fire. Does he speak up? No. So Harry has been illegally entered in, and he enters into this tournament by cheating. Harry then gets into this tournament, and it's perilous. One of the tasks that's designed to do is it says that you have to go into the, to a lair, and that you have to steal an egg from a dragon. And Harry chooses the fourth dragon. And he goes up against the dragon and he steals the egg. The next task that he has to do is you have to dive into the lake just outside of Hogwarts. And you have to, you have to rescue a person that's being kept under the water there by people called merpeople. Then you have to go through mazes. And those mazes are filled with riddles and monsters and dragons and things like that. And then you come to the last task of all. And that's getting the Triwizard Tournament Cup. And what happens there becomes the darkest part yet. Here's what happens. At the same time, Cedric Diggory, and that's one of the, the participants from another one of the witchcraft schools, and Harry reach the Triwizard Cup at the same time. They decide to share in the glory. They talk about it, and the, and the, the prize is a thousand gold coins. They both grab on to the cup at the same time. What happens then is that they are mysteriously transported to a graveyard. Light starts flashing around them, green light. It's the Avada Kedavra curse. One of the green lights hit Cedric Diggory and kills him dead. The next thing happens is that Harry's been knocked off his feet. He's unconscious. When he wakes up, he's tied to a tombstone. That tombstone reads Tom Riddle. That's Lord Voldemort's father. And he hears a voice, bone of my father, Bone of my bone, I chant to thee, I summon thee. And then, from out of nowhere, one of Lord Voldemort's men starts coming out of the corner, and he's dragging a man-sized cauldron. He then goes and takes the withered body of Lord Voldemort and puts it into the cauldron. The next step he does, as Harry watches, is he pulls a dagger out. He takes his wrist, and he slices off his wrist. 
he lets the blood run into the cauldron and mix with the body of Lord Voldemort. The next thing, he walks over to Harry. Harry's screaming. He walks over to Harry, picks up Harry's wrist, and he cuts it at a strategic location to let blood run out. He then mixes Harry's blood along with the blood that he just caught, got from his own self, and he mixes that with the cauldron and with Lord Voldemort's withered body. The cauldron begins to glow white, and from that cauldron arises Lord Voldemort, more horrible, more powerful, more evil than ever. Brothers and sisters, what just took place is what we call in Satanism and Druidism a satanic blood ritual. And that's right there in the book. And my question is this. If this is fantasy, and it's only a book, why is she putting actual rituals that have to do with Satanism, Druidism, in those books? Those are actual rituals. And if, yet, if you ask a child about those things, a lot of time they won't even remember that particular part. There's also sexual magic. It's talked about uh, the witches and the wizards going off in the bushes together. There's black magic, there's white magic, and there's also demonic possession, spirit possession. Because at one point, Lord Voldemort is so weak, he has to live. He can't, uh, he's, he's killed all the unicorns, and he can't drink their blood anymore. So he has to survive by possessing the body of someone else. Professor Quirrell is one of Harry's professors. And he, profess, he possesses the body of that professor. And in the movie, when you look at Professor Quirrell, you look at him from the face on, it's Professor Quirrell. But if he turns around, it's Lord Voldemort. He's living in the very back of the body of, Lord Vol uh, of, of uh, Professor Quirrell in order to survive. So now you have demon possession. Can you see now where all the abominations that were spoken of in Deuteronomy chapter 18, 9 have now been placed in the Harry Potter books? Each and every single one of them. And I believe it's books like this. Here's to write a silver broomstick, and you see the, the female appeal. Here's to stir a magic cauldron. There, these are all by Silver Ravenwolf, a witch's guide to casting and conjuring. And if you're not sure whether a muggle or not, you can even get this muggle's guide to magic. It's a, it says down at the bottom, it says, fully illustrated guide to understanding the Harry Potter books, as if you really wanted to know. Here's a sorcerer's companion, and this book actually tells you it's a guide to the magical world of Harry Potter. And this book actually shows you where the mythological creatures came from and the folklore behind them. And I believe it's books like that that are leading our children toward books like this. And this is the Satanic Bible by Anton Zandor LaVey. This is the Bible that I studied from and taught from seven and a half years being a Satanist high priest. Here's another book if you want to be a Satanic witch. It's the Satanic Witch by Anton Zandor LaVey. Now, Let's look at what our wonderful Christian leadership is telling us about Harry Potter. Because you would think that they should be on guard and on watch for us. Let's see. Let's first of all look at Christianity Today. It's a popular Christian magazine. And the author of this is Ted Olson. He's one of the editors of that magazine. And look what he says. As far as I can tell, no major Christian leader has come out to condemn J.K. Rowling's series. Many have given it a thumbs up. Even those Christians known for criticizing all that is popular culture have been pretty positive about Potter. So they're saying that Potter is okay. Now let's go to a popular Christian columnist named Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson has a popular radio program called Breakpoint. On one of his break points, he was talking about the Harry Potter series. Let's examine what he says. It may relieve you to know that the magic in these books is purely mechanical as opposed to occultic. That is, Harry and his friends cast spells, read crystal balls, and turn themselves into animals, but they don't make contact with the supernatural world. Where in the world is he getting that from? I have to say, some of these men need to spend more time in the Word of God and less time in Harry Potter. He also goes on to say, These books also feature wizards and witches and magical potions, but in addition, they inspire the imagination within a Christian framework and prepare the hearts of the readers for the real-life story of Christ. 
Oh, 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 I see. I see. Because Harry Potter is almost Christ-like. He survives death. He can overcome death. That's got to be it. Uh, some other things. Let's look at focus on the family. James Dobson. James Dobson has focus on the family. And focus on the family is one of the more popular Christian programs. He does books. He also does uh, many, many videos that are designed for Christian living. And he says... Though set mostly in a wizard's world, the Potter books promote, through their characters, friendship, love, bravery, self-reliance, the importance of family, and tolerance toward those different from us. They depict the quest for knowledge, wisdom, and right action, the universal journey every human takes. And then they came out and toned that down because enough people started writing in and asking him where he was getting all this from. And the next October issue said, a reader drawn in would find that the real world of witchcraft is not Harry Potter's world, neither attractive nor harmless. It is powerful and evil. And I say they should never have made the first statement in the first place. What the real witches say, this is uh, the British Isles Pagan Federation. Naturally, the island's Pagan Federation is pleased. Though it refuses to admit new members under the age of 18, it deals with an average of 100 inquiries a month from youngsters who want to become witches and has occasionally been swamped with calls. It goes on to say the Pagan Federation has appointed a youth officer to deal with a flood of inquiries following the success of the Harry Potter books, which describe magic and wizardry. And then we come to Harry Potter being used in Christian imagery. And this is one of the most blasphemous things, and this is how it got into the church. Because Scott Moore is a professor at Baylor University. He is a very popular professor there. He's a professor of philosophy. And he says that by studying the Harry Potter series and by studying the Word of God, he began to see that the world of Harry Potter and God's Word lined up parallel with each other. And he says he knows that because the unicorn and the phoenix are symbols that represent Christ. Now, you show me in Scripture anywhere where Jesus Christ is referred to as a unicorn <laughs> or where he's called a phoenix. I'm sorry, Mr. Moore, he was resurrected, not reincarnated. The other one was sent to me by a lady out of Syracuse, New York. You can get this off of SyracuseNews.com. Uh, and it's entitled, uh, the, the article was entitled, uh, Harry Potter Assist in Religious Instruction. And this, this wonderful woman, Madeline Leah Coney, and that's her, how you pronounce her last name, is a youth minister. She has been a youth minister at this particular church for over five years. She does not read Harry Potter, but her three children do. One day, they left Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire down on the kitchen table. And when she went down there, and she started asking them about what this was, they started telling her about all the fun things, about Harry riding on broomsticks and things. She got a wonderful idea. Then she took it to the minister of that church, and she sold it to the minister. He thought it was a wonderful idea. And for one solid week, they turned that entire church into Hogwarts School of Wizardry and Witchcraft. And the 7th and 8th grade students at that Christian school were taught by instructors dressed up like the Harry Potter instructors in the books. And they said it was a wonderful way to teach the Bible. You put all your students in a circle, and you sit there in the middle, and you read them Harry Potter, and then you line up a scripture right after that to show them how it parallels with each other. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. When we have to use witchcraft, something that God says he hates wholeheartedly, to teach the word of God, we're in serious, serious trouble. No doubt about it. The Satanic Bible, Anton LaBey writes, I dip my forefinger in the watery blood of your impotent mad redeemer and write over his thorn-torn brow, true prince of evil, the king of the slaves. Talking about the Lord. He says, I gaze into the glassy eye of your fearsome Jehovah and pluck him by the beard. I uplift a broad axe and open his worm-eaten skull. Yet we're letting our children get involved in things that are leading them toward these teachings. Behold the crucifix. What does it symbolize? Pallid incompetence hanging on a tree. Alistair Crowley writes, Below the, this abyss we find the moral qualities of man, of which there are six. The highest is symbolized by the number four. In other words, number four is divinity. Its nature is fatherly. 
Now let's look at Harry Potter. In Harry Potter at Hogwarts, there are four headmasters. Remember, there's magic in numbers. Alistair Crowley told us that. There are four founders of the school. There are four witchcraft fraternities. Harry is the fourth challenger in the Wizard Cup. Harry picks the fourth dragon to go up against. And Harry pulls out Horntail, the name of the dragon, and the number four. Coincidence? I don't think so. And I knew that if they came out with this movie, that this would be the number one top movie. And I mean, they did it up right. They even chose uh, da Daniel Radcliffe, the young boy, he's 12 years old, chose that young boy to play the part of Harry Potter. Chris Columbus, the producer of the movie, saw him in a BBC production of David Copperfield and said he would be perfect for the part. And you know, he, this, this boy's a superstar right now, but I have to wonder what his life is going to be like when these Potter movies are over. Here's Harry Potter, and he's holding on to that owl, and that owl is symbolic because it is a familiar. In witchcraft, they have several different familiars. We've always been seeing the witch with the cat. Well, the cat is one of them, but there's also the toad and the owl. And so that acts as his familiar. And one of the most blasphemous things is where this particular movie was shot. Because the U.S., Warner Brothers, wanted to do the movie in the U.S. They wanted to use U.S. characters and shoot the movie over here in the United States. The Ministry of Film from England said, no, there's no place over in the United States that would do justice to Hogwarts School of Wizardry and Witchcraft. But if you come over here to England, we've got castles and all kinds of things that will help and, and they'll look even better. Here's what they chose. Gloucester Cathedral. It is a place that has been used to worship the Holy Lord God for over 1,300 years. It's known for its stained glass windows, and on the inside of there, there are spiral staircases of stone and beautiful furniture. And when they first approached the, the good Dean uh, uh, Nicholas Burry, he's the head of Gloucester, they said, we want to come in and we want to shoot this movie in your cathedral. And he said, no, because of all the pagan images and the witchcraft, we, I have to say no. So he took a stand. Praise him. You know, praise God. However, after two more meetings with Warner Brothers, he made this statement. Gloucester is one of the most beautiful cathedrals, and its friendliness and human scale have often been remarked upon. It is an atmospheric place and good for a story about a boy making friends in his first year at school. In other words, the good dean sold out. I'm sure they crossed his palm with a little bit more money and probably said, look, we'll put your cathedral on the map. We'll make it a tourist attraction. Think of all the people coming over who want to see it. Here's the inside of that cathedral. It actually houses a ministry for young men studying to be ministers. And those are the young boys that you see down there in the bottom of the picture. Then you see all the religious books there. Now watch what happens when the movie company moves in. Everything's totally gone. And they're making way for the school to represent a school where children go to learn witchcraft. Here's another uh, photo where they actually put in a trophy case to make it look more realistic. Those are supposed to be Quidditch uh, trophies. Here is a, a, a Tom Riddle Award for Special Services to Hogwarts. Vanity Fair even grabbed onto this because they knew it was going to be so popular, and they did a 22-page spread on this. It, it, all magazines, it seemed like, in the United States were all, all carrying stories about Harry Potter. So witchcraft became the number one subject. So they were ready to shoot the movie. They had the characters all in place. And this is the movie poster. And you notice it says the magic begins November the 16th. This was actually released on November the 15th as a pre-screening. I got to see it because my stepson works for Baskin and Robbins. Boy, that's good ice cream, too. <laughs> Just had a rush for chocolate chip cookie dough. And he got us in free so we could go see it. And my wife and I went and we took notebooks together and we copied down everything that we saw. And I mean, when we got home, we looked and I, it, we just, everything we, that she saw, I saw in the movie. And here is the children crossing across the river and they have to cross across that to get to Hogwarts School of Wizardry and Witchcraft and there's Gloucester Cathedral. And they have to cross over there by boat and torch. And you know, I started looking at that and it started bringing back that uh, river of sticks, crossing over the river of sticks into hell. 
When Harry goes on a, a zoo trip with the Dursleys, he discovers he has an uncanny ability. He looks and there's a huge python behind a glass cage. That snake begins to communicate to Harry. And Harry finds out that he can communicate back to that serpent. And that serpent tells him that all he wants to do is be set free, that he, he was poor him, he was just captured, and he really didn't do anything to be captured, and all he wants to do is go home. So Harry wishes the glass to be gone, and poof, the glass is gone. The snake comes out and thanks Harry and slithers off. And isn't that kind of what Satan does with us, the serpent does with us? Pity poor me, all I did was question why God was sitting on the throne and he kicked me out. And all I want to do is be set free. Here is Hogwarts train. This is an actual train that actually runs on a track. They were going to dismantle it after the movie. They decided it would be a beautiful tourist attraction. Here it is from an aerial point of view, and you can see it. Here is Harry going to platform nine and three-fourths, and he is carrying his belongings, and then there is his familiar. He's told, he's told that he has to go to platform nine and three-fourths. He doesn't see it. Hagrid tells him that oh, he has the ability to walk through that wall, and he walks through a brick wall, and there is not platform nine and three-fourths, and he gets on the train to go to Hogwarts. When he gets there, he's taken by Hagrid to a place called Diagon Alley. Diagon Alley is a school supply place, kind of like when we take our children to Walmart to get them pencils and books and paper and things like that. They go to buy magical supplies, and this is where he discovers his wand. This is the logo for Hogwarts, and you see the four fraternities on there, and then you see down here at the bottom, there is Latin words, Draco, Dormians, Nunquam, and then Tiliundus. And I, didn't, I, I couldn't quite decipher that. I know a little bit of Latin, but I couldn't quite decipher that. And so I called up a, a friend of mine, I called up Bill Snevlin, and I said, Bill, I said, I, I see this on there, and I said, I don't know what it says. I said, can you decipher it for me and call me back? He says, I'll get to work on it. Five minutes later, he came back, and he says, here's what I got. Never tickle a sleeping dragon. And I said, well, that's real interesting. And he said, yeah, that'd be good advice, too. <laughs> and I, I said, no, Bill, I said, is that a, a message? Are, are they telling us don't wake up a sleeping dragon? Because if you wake up a sleeping dragon, you have a monster on your hands. Is this telling us, those people who are trying to delve into this and find out what's behind these books, are they telling us leave it alone? Interesting. When they go into the, the uh, hall, they find thousands of floating candles and they're levitating. Let me tell you how levitation works. If I walk over to that chair and I put my hand over it, and I start to do incantations, and I, I start to use my mind abilities, and all of a sudden the chair begins to raise. Is it me that's raising that chair? No. Remember that the person who is doing the practicing does not have any special powers. They are being lied to. They are duped. Okay? What happens is that you have tapped into demonic entities that can work in the spiritual realm and also in the physical realm. I've been in situations where there have been deliverances, uh, where people have actually levitated up off the floor. I've been in uh, places where they have been working Ouija boards, where the planter would rise up, spin around in the air, and then shoot across the room. I've seen chairs move across the room. It's not because someone is doing it. There's an actual invisible demonic entity there, and they are doing it. They are actually doing the work. They're actually doing the moving. So here you have demons lifting candles into the air. Here's a sorting hat. And you see it's got eyes, nose, mouth, eyebrows. This is the sorting hat that they use to decide which, uh, to read the minds of the student. And that is the same hat that is used in the other movie and the other story, Lord of the Rings. Remember that the same people that brought you the Harry Potter movie also brought you Lord of the Rings. And we know that it is because here's Gandalf wearing it. And notice how it's crumpled over just like the sorting hat with the wide brim. At the school, they have resident ghosts. Here are a few of them. Uh, the one over to the left is called the Bloody Baron. He is stained with blood because he kills. And the fat friar there is a spirit now because he started out being a good friar and then he started doing other kinds of practices and ended up being a, a tortured, tormented spirit. Then there's nearly headless Nick, that gentleman there with his head kind of hanging there. That was a gentleman who was supposed to have his head severed with a guillotine and didn't quite get done, so it just kind of hangs there. And then there's the gray lady, and she uh, constantly communicates with the students there at Hogwarts. 
This is Albus Dumbledore. He is the headmaster at Hogwarts. He's the one that tells Harry there is no evil, only power, and those too weak to seek it. This is Professor McGonagall. She is the one who's the shapeshifter. She constantly changes herself from this form to a cat and then back. But look at the blackboard behind her. Because if you don't see this in the movie, if you're watching the movie and you really don't know what you're looking for, you would miss it. Those are actual symbols out of an alchemy book. Out of an actually alchemy book. You see at the top there, you can even make out the triangles and the circles and the half crescent moons. And those are occult writings. That clearly behind her is a circle, and inside of that circle is a triangle, along with other symbols around it. Here she is again. This is Servius Snape. He is the professor of potions and teaches potions. This is Professor Flitwick. He is a goblin. Cute, isn't he? So Harry gets on his broom and he learns his first flying lesson. And what he does is he learns that you walk over to the broom, you hold your hand out and you say up, and the broom levitates up into your hand. What does that teach your child? Voice command. That you have things because you say things right. Now, some of the things we've been talking about, uh, this is Harry's broom. Not really, it's just a toy. But this is Harry's broom. It's called the Nimbus 2000. It's the hot rod of the witch's broom. Okay? And you see, when you look at it, you can see the young boy here, and he's in the air, and there's nothing underneath him, because if you go down further, you can see the trees. That is telling your child something. What is it telling them? That if you have this particular toy, you can fly. And then, if you go up to the very top, in white letters it says, Broom does not really fly. Now, we laugh at that, but let me tell you why they put that on there. In Washington State, it was on the Internet, on, in Washington State, a young boy, I don't remember what his age was, got one of these brooms. He went up on the top of his roof. He told his parents that a voice told him, you're like Harry Potter, fly. And he jumped off and he broke both legs. Now, the parents were going to sue the toy company, so the toy company decided they better put that on there to keep from being sued. Ah, uh -huh. here he is, and this is him levitating the broom by voice command, saying up, and the broom rises up. Here's a flying lesson here. This student is not uh, listening to what the teacher says, and she, he's rising on his own. This is levitation class, where she's levitating a feather by the use of a magic wand. And notice the Latin terminology, wingardium liviosa. Wingardium, wing, meaning feather, guardium, up, and then Liviosa levitate. They're told to not go into the Forbidden Forest because there are creatures in there that they don't want to encounter. But Harry, of course, does not listen. He doesn't do what he's told. So they venture into the Forbidden Forest. And this is where it starts really getting scary in the movie. As they go into the forest, they run upon this scene. And this is Harry over in the left corner. That unicorn has just been slayed and that ominous black figure there in the middle is Lord Voldemort. What's happening is he's kneeling and drinking the blood of that unicorn. This is Fluffy, the three-headed dog. Now you see why I said he's not your ordinary Fido. He's not your house dog. This house will, this, this dog will rip you to shreds. And yet, this is how they portray this demon as Fluffy. Toning it down. Here's another cute picture of him. Any cute? This is the golden snitch. This is what you have to capture to, to uh, win the Quidditch game. Here, uh, they're on their way to, to get the Sorcerer's Stone, and there's a young boy that stands in their way, and Hermione is putting a spell on him, turning him to stone. Here is the mirror of Erised, where he contacts his dead parents, and they communicate to him through that mirror. To get to the Sorcerer's Stone, they have to go through this chess game. It's an immense chess game. It's huge, and it's a scary scene because... Those two figures down there at the very bottom, they have to ride those, and those knight-type figures would become animated, and the one would pick up the sword and try to smash that one on the bottom. So it, they almost become killed during playing this game. They finally get across from that. They get in. They find out that Voldemort has possessed the body of Professor Quirrell. Uh, Harry destroys the Sorcerer's Stone. 
but he doesn't destroy Voldemort and he slithers off and of course now it's ready for the next movie. Popular magazine started picking this up. He, uh, Daniel Radcliffe appeared on TV Guide, the cover of TV Guide. And then the figures came out. You knew that if the movie came out, they were come, come out with the figures. And this is kind of interesting because you get in the bottom there, in the bottom left-hand corner, what's called a casting stone. Look at that inverted pentagram with the crescent moon and the two circles around it. That wasn't by coincidence that that happened to show up on that figure. Here he is in a Quidditch outfit. This is what you wear to play the game. You could even get Harry Potter flying in the air over Hogwarts. This is an actual coin. This is legal tender on the Isle of Man. It is worth one crown, and as I understand it, that's like $5 in American money. And if you look at the coin, this is the only currency in existence that has, I mean, just out and out overt picture of witchcraft on it, representing. And if you look on the coin, it's Harry Potter on one side, and if you turn it on the other side, it's the queen. Here's a Harry Potter tr uh, puzzle game, complete with a spiral down in the corner. And the wonderful people that brought you Pokemon cards, Wizards of the Coast, are now ready to unleash the Harry Potter trading game. So now you have the Harry Potter cards to deal with. We just got rid of the Pokemon cards. Here they are again. This is a starter set. You don't like your Uno game, you can get Uno Harry Potter. Uh, here is the trivia game complete with the sorting hat and the casting stones down there at the bottom. PlayStation came up with a Harry Potter game for, for PlayStation, for, for those who uh, don't quite read yet and still play electronics, you can still get into Harry Potter. Here's a screen from that game. Here's Harry Potter making his way through Hogwarts in search of the Sorcerer's Stone. Notice this screen and notice that lightning bolt up in that left-hand corner. That flashes on there for a split minute. Then notice the star-shaped figure over the Sorcerer's Stone there in the ceiling. You think they put that in there by coincidence. Remember the video games that were shown on the Occult in Your Living Room video. Here's another scene. That's the Avada Kedavra curse. We know that because there's the magic wand. Harry's holding the green light. Voldemort is the serpent over there in the corner. And the kids are, are walking by and they're getting ready to be attacked by a troll. You can get a Harry Potter pop-up book. Just be careful what pops up. You can get a Harry Potter lunch pail. Put a spell on your sandwich. You don't like the peanut butter and jelly sandwich your mom made, you can make it into bologna. Here's a sticker book. Here are some of the stickers, complete with lightning bolts that you can peel off of there and put on your forehead. Uh, Legos came out with Harry Potter Lego set. This is a picture of it. It was released September 2001. I think he looks better as a Lego myself. <laughs> There's his magic wand, looks like a baseball bat. You can build, uh, magic is building, it says, and you can build scenes from that. Clearly, there is a Pied Piper that's steering our children away. His name is Harry Potter. We need to do something about it before our children get stolen from out from under our very nose. Children wanted the Hogwarts to be so real that Scholastic Inc. decided to put an actual website up to where children could go and sign up for the School of Witchcraft and Wizardry right there online. They wanted this to be real. And I believe it's all leading our children toward this. You see, we don't know what the mark of the beast is. We can all fantasize, we can all come up with our own ideas as to what the mark is, but we really don't know what it is. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Because if innocent children, you see the innocence in their eyes and their curiosity, if they'll receive a painted lightning bolt on their forehead, they'll receive anything. In fact, they'd be the first ones to run to jump in line to receive the mark. We've desensitized them that much. We've let them be desensitized. Here's Harry Potter once again. And I mean, this is in the school system now, big time. Harry Potter calendar. Another Harry Potter sticker book. And you know, you scratch your head and you wonder, what in the world can we do about all this? Well, I think that there's still time, otherwise God would not be revealing these things. The first thing I think we need to do is repent, because you see, it's our fault that we allowed it in. 
It's our fault that we allowed it into our country, our homes, and our churches, and our schools, and we need to repent before God for that. Then I think we need to pray. I think we need to pray because I know there's power in prayer. I know that. I think we need to intercede for people like Joanne Kathleen Rowling, the author, and, and pray that God will send someone like a, a prophet or someone, I don't know, someone to deliver the word of God to where she'll know 100% that it's God speaking to her and telling her what she's doing. Then I think we need to support every minister and ministry that is trying to expose the darkness because they are the ones that are on the battle lines. We need to organize. How many, how many times do we have like church groups, Bible study groups, women's prayer groups, do you realize that the church is the only authority on the face of the earth that God has given that has the ability to stop this? The body of Christ. We have the authority by the Lord Jesus Christ to walk in those bookstores and break the spell that's been cast over those books that draw our children to buy them. But we don't do it. Then I think we need to educate. I think we need to get materials like these and other materials into people's hands. Because that's, the, the Bible says very specifically, my people perish for lack of knowledge. God does not want us to be ignorant of what Satan is doing. And I think we need to write. I think we need to write all these Christian leaders that have told us that Harry Potter is nothing more than fantasy and that it's innocent and educate them and let them know how we feel. Then we need to boycott. We need to boycott things like Coca-Cola, Mattel, Scholastic Inc. Let me tell you about Scholastic Inc. Scholastic Inc. is the organization that gets the Harry Potter materials into the school system. They reach 400 million children a year. They send out, they started out with sending out uh, stories called Goosebumps. Then it went to Harry Potter. Now, as I understand it, they're getting ready to unleash things like vampirism and zombies. And there's a manual that comes along with all these teachings, and it encourages the, the teacher to sit the children in a class-type atmosphere in a circle and read out loud from these things. Coca-Cola has vowed that they're going to put Harry Potter on every Coke can by the year 2003. Then the last thing I think we need to do is we need to keep watch. Because if we don't stop things like Harry Potter, if we don't look at and see the true evil behind just this thing alone, book, the movie, everything that has to do with Harry Potter alone, as I stated before, Satan will come through the back door with something even bigger and even more evil. We need to keep watch. You see... Our children rely on us to teach them things. They rely on us. They don't have the money to go out and buy these books. It's the parents that go out and buy the books for them, or that we buy them for somebody else's children. We've got to get educated. We've got to get right before the Lord. This is an abomination unto the Lord. No two ways about it. God doesn't say, I, I won't condone witchcraft unless it's fantasy, or unless it's a comic book, or unless it's a movie. Witchcraft to him is witchcraft. And you don't have to put on a robe. You don't have to be, you know, lighting candles. All you have to do is be in rebellion against God to be practicing witchcraft. All you have to be doing is not be doing what God has instructed you to do. You're in rebellion. That's witchcraft. They rely on us to teach them right and wrong. Our children rely on us to teach them what's good and what's evil. They rely on us to teach them love and hate. And most of all, they rely on us to stand by them Show them the truth in things, not lie to them, not sugarcoat it, but to sit down with them and show them why these things are wrong, why the movie is not to be seen, why these books are not to be read. Don't just tell a child, don't do that, because they're in rebellion. What they'll do is they'll go behind your back. Somebody gets the movie on the video, guaranteed, they'll go watch it behind your back because you didn't answer their question. And most of all, the one thing they rely on us to do is to take the authority that we've been given as parents, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles, as the body of Christ, they rely on us to break the spell of Harry Potter. God bless you all, and thank you. All right, Steve has uh, done a wonderful job exposing what is wrong with Harry Potter. But now what do we do? Let's assume that someone in the room or someone that's watching the videotape has dabbled in some of this or something else, perhaps Ouija boards, uh, tarot cards, 
How do we get out of it? How do we get out of that ditch? Well, there's only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. All right, well, how do we get him to pull us out? Just like he pulled out uh, Steve Dollins. He's pulled out Bill Schnevelin and many others. How do we get out of it? Because I can tell you, Satan doesn't let people out of his kingdom very easy. It is difficult, and the only door I know of to get out is Jesus Christ. So how do we accept Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing we have to realize is that we are sinners. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If we don't think we've done wrong, then we have no need of a Savior, and there isn't any hope for us. The next thing is we have to realize is we cannot earn it. We cannot buy it. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right, how do we reach out and take that gift? How do we reach out and ask the Lord Jesus to come in and to wash us clean of this filth, to write our name in the book of life, and to break ties with all of this darkness? Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 gives the answer. It says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What's that saying? It's simply saying it's not enough to believe Jesus is Lord and not say it. It's not enough to say it and not believe it. We've got to say it and we've got to believe it. Matthew 10, 32 and 10, 33 says, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. What's that saying? It's simply saying this. If you believe that Hogwarts is your wizardry school, if you believe that Harry Potter or tarot cards or the Ouija board or whatever else it is that the devil's got his noose around your neck with is your salvation, and if you can't say it to your friends, then you aren't saved. You've got to be able, and rest assured, when you become a Christian, you will lose some friends. You will lose some habits. Praise God. You'll get out of it, right? We need to be able to pull out of that filth and out of that darkness and turn to the one true light, and that's Jesus. How do we do that? We have to confess it with our mouth. Now, you may have prayed this prayer before. I talked to one fellow in the prison ministry. He said, oh, I've already prayed that nine times. But he's still in prison. What's different? He hasn't changed. He hasn't changed his life. It's not enough to say it. You've got to believe it and you've got to follow it. You may have prayed this prayer before, but let's all pray it together again. I pray it every day. Let's bow our head and pray. And you folks on videotape, you want out of this, you pray it. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I admit I'm a sinner. I admit I'm a sinner. And I confess with my mouth. And I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, died on the cross, arose three days later, sits at the right hand of the Father, and I receive His blood to wash my sins away. Keep me holy and save me in the day of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, there's a lot of folks that say, that's all you got to do? Just pray that little prayer? Now you're going to heaven. It's not what my Bible says. It's not that easy, folks. It's not an easy gospel. Matthew 7.21 says, Not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those that doeth the will of my Father. Well, what's the will of the Father? He says, If you love me, keep my commandments. He says, Be holy, for I am holy. In other words, just because Jesus just cut all of that filth off of you, just because he washed you clean, doesn't mean you can't get dirty again. Okay. Now what we've got to do is make a decision that we're going to try our very best to follow his laws. Well, how do you win in the, in the game of Monopoly? You have to read the rules. You have to follow the rules in order to win. Same thing. In Christianity, you have to read the rules. You have to follow the rules. Where are those rules? They're in the King James Version of the Bible. Not one of the perversions, the King James ver Version. Read that, follow that with all of your heart. Now, there's one more step. It says that we're supposed to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. So you folks on video, you need to turn to somebody and say, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You folks in here need to also do it. So let me ask you this question. 
How many of you prayed that prayer, and you'd already prayed it before, but tonight you prayed it rededicating your life, saying, nah, I may have slipped in the past, but from now on, I'm going to do it right. How many of you prayed the prayer rededicating your life? Can I see your hands? 